we can't start a meet. We gotta, if everybody quiet down and we'll. If we could get everybody's attention so we can get going, we'll call the Metropolitan Planning Commission meeting to order of May 9th, 2019. I want to welcome everybody down and we will start on item B, which is the adoption of the agenda. Commissioners, uh, the agenda was um, sent to you prior. Any edits or questions? There's a motion to approve and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. Now we are on to item C, which is the approval of the April 25th, 2019 minutes. <laughs> and those were also sent to you prior. Uh, any questions, uh, additions? All right, we'll need a motion to approve those minutes. There's been a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the minutes are adopted. Now we are on to the recognition of the council members, and we take these as, as we see the council members come in, and, and first was Councilman Pridemore, you want to go now, or I saw Councilman Pridemore. Where's he at? There. Okay, all right, thank you, Councilman. We want to make sure we take care of, care of you. Uh, Councilman Hall, I saw Councilman Hall. There's Councilman Hall. You'll, okay, perfect. Councilman Hall is okay. And then Council Lady Roberts, I, you want to go now or? Yeah, come on up. Right. Welcome. Hello. Hello, all. Thank you again for what you do. Sure appreciate all the service you all do, and I know this is not an easy job. I have three today, and they're all easy. We've all done our homework, and they're all three. I'm in support of all three, starting with number 20, which is 2019-SP-025-001. Broadstone in the Nations, we've been having conversations for the last few months with the builders and the Neighborhood Association and the Planning and Zoning Committee in the Nations, and you never get 100% support, but we have pretty close to it. This is something that's going to benefit the neighborhood, bringing apartments and putting, putting feet on the street, as they say. Number 21, which is 2019-SP-026-001, the Ver Vernon Avenue SP. We have worked with the Neighborhood Association the past few months, but we probably have some more work to do on that. But as it currently stands, we are in support of that as well. And then number 29, which is 2018-S-210-001. We have done a slew of conversations on this one, and I think that Dwayne is gonna stay and uh, represent uh, Ned Michaels, the builder on this, but he's done a phenomenal job, and he's come to the neighborhood associations, and he's made a point of getting to know the neighbors even when he doesn't have something on the agenda. So Ned uh, Michaels is the builder on this, and I am more than pleased with what he's done. So. Thank you, Council Lady. And just so you know, 29's been, been pulled off the consent. Just. Well, I don't, I'm against it then. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not against it, I'm a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just wanna let you know. Thank you. All right, and then I saw Councilor Porterfield, but I think she might have left. Yeah, I think she left after, okay. And then Councilor Blaylock, I know you're, you're okay. Okay, perfect. Did I, any other council members? I wanna make sure we get everybody. All right, that completes item D. So now we are on item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Sean. All right, items for deferral or withdrawal include item one on page six of your agenda, 2018 CP 011002, the South Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the July 18th Planning Commission meeting. Item two, 2018 SP-029-002, 405-40th Avenue North Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. 
Item 4, 2019 SP-006-001, 3rd Avenue North SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Item 9 on page 7 of your agenda, 2018Z-039PR-001, a request to rezone from RS5 to RM20A zoning for various properties on Meridian Street. The staff recommendation is to... Lisa, can you confirm the date for that? We'll come back to that one. <laughs> Item 10 on page 8 of your agenda, 2019Z023PR001. A request to rezone from CS to MUL and RM9 zoning for property on Murfreesboro Pike and Lake Villa Drive. The staff recommendation is to defer to the June 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item 14A. 2019 CP 008001, the North Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 13th Planning Commission meeting. And the associated case, item 14B, 2019 SP 035001. 2400 West Hyman Street, SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 13th Planning Commission meeting. Item 16A, 2019 CP 011001, South Nashville Community Plan Amendment. The staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. The associated case 16B, 2019 SP 036001, the Napier and Sudicum SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. And the associated case 16C, 93P-025-001, the Napier and Sudicum PUD cancellation. <coughs> Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd meeting. Item 22 on page 11 of your agenda, 2019 SP-028-001, 1418 and 1420 Third Avenue North. Request to rezone from IR to SP on Third Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Item 26, 2019 SP 034001, the North Canton Pike SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Item 32, on page 13 of your agenda, 2019 S 071001, lots 1, 2, and 3 at 1003 Neely's Bend. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Item 41 on page 14 of your agenda, 2019Z061PR001. Staff recommendation, it's a request to rezone from RS5 to RM20A for properties on McClurkin Avenue. <coughs> Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Item 45, 2019Z065PR-001 on page 15 of your agenda. A request to rezone from RS5 to R6 zoning for property located on Katy Street. The staff recommendation is to defer to June 13th Planning Commission meeting. And to go back to the item that we missed, it is item 9. 2018Z039PR-001, a request to rezone from RS5 to RM20A for properties on Meridian Street. And the staff recommendation is to defer to the May 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. And so commissioners uh, and Sean, make sure we get these right. These are items for deferral withdrawal items 1, 2, 4, 9, 10, 14A, 14B, 16A, 16B, 16C, 22, 26, 32, 41, and 45. Is that correct? That's correct. Commissioners, you've heard those items. Uh, is there a motion to defer? There's been a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And those items are for deferral. And withdraw. Item F, the consent agenda. All right, before we begin consent, as information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. 
your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. Items on consent. <laughs> Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. And the items on the consent agenda begin with item three on page six, 2018 SP-057-001. Eaton Creek Commons. This is a request to rezone from SP and RS-15 to SP zoning for properties on Ashland City Highway. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 7A, 20669P-001 on page seven of your agenda, the Harding Place Center PUD amendment, request to amend a PUD on Harding Place and South Perimeter Park Drive. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And the associated case 7B, 8-68P-002, the Harding Place, PUD, Harding Place Center PUD cancellation, a request to cancel a portion of the planned unit development at Harding Place. The staff recommendation is to approve if the associated planned unit development amendment is approved and disapprove if the associated planned unit development amendment is not approved. And I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recused on both 7A and 7B. Item 15A on page nine of your agenda, 2019 CP 008002, the North Nashville Community Plan Amendment, request to amend the North Nashville Community Plan by adding a supplemental policy for properties located on Taylor Street, Adams Street, and First Avenue North. The staff recommendation is to approve the supplemental policy as written by staff. And the associated case item 15B, 2019 SP-029-001, Newhoff, a request to rezone from IG to specific plan for properties on Adams, Taylor, and First Avenue to permit a mixed use development. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions if the associated plan amendment is approved. If the associated plan amendment is disapproved, then staff recommends disapproval. Item 17 on page 10 of your agenda, 2007 SP-037-001, the Forest View SP final, request for final site plan approval for property located on Bell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 19, 2019 SP-024-001, 523-27th Avenue, request to rezone from RS5 to SP zoning at 523-27th Avenue. Approve, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 20, 2019 SP-025-001, Broadstone Nations, a request to rezone from IR to SP zoning for properties at, on Centennial Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 21, 2019 SP-026-001, the Vernon Avenue SP, request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning for properties on Vernon Avenue to permit a multifamily residential development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 23 on page 11 of your agenda, 2019 SP-031-001-4307 Central Pike, request to rezone from RS-15 to SP zoning for properties located on Central Pike, North New Hope Road to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 25, 2019 SP-033001, Riverside Glen SP, request to rezone from OR20 to specific plan zoning for property located on Lock Road. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item 27 on page 12 of your agenda, 2017 S-250-001, the Rural Hill Road Bend subdivision, request for final plat approval to create eight lots on property located on Rural Hill Road. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. <laughs> Item 33 on page 13 of the agenda, 2019 S-073-001, 
We subdivision of lot nine on the map of Alpine Terrace. Request for final plat approval to create three lots for property on Stivers Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 35, 45-86P-002, the Berryville Grandview Village PUD revision. Request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for a portion of a planned unit development located on Old Hickory Boulevard. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions, including conditions requiring the construction of sidewalks per MCSP standards and the dedication and planting of a scenic landscape easement, unless these requirements are varied by the Board of Zoning Appeals. Item 36, 88P-040-003, the Sam's Club PUD cancellation, a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development for property located on Old Hickory Boulevard. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 37 on page 14 of your agenda, 2018 UD-001-003, the River Trace UDO sign modification. Request for modica modification to the River Trace Urban Design Overlay sign standards to allow a sign of 30.25 square feet for property on Highway 100. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 38, 2019Z-050PR-001, request to rezone from RS5 to RM20A zoning for properties on Weekly Avenue. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 39, 2019Z052PR-001, request to rezone from RS5 to R6A zoning for property located on West McKinney Avenue. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 40, 2019Z060PR001, request to rezone from R10 to RM20A zoning for properties located on Creative Way. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 42, 2019Z-062PR-001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUNA zoning for property located on Baptist World Center Drive. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 44 on page 15 of your agenda, 2019Z-064PR-001, request to rezone from IWD to MUNA zoning for property located on Little Green Street. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 46, 2019Z-066PR-001, a request to rezone from AR2A to CS zoning for property located on Nolansville Pike. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 47, 2019Z-067PR-001, request to rezone from RS5 to R6A zoning for property located on Lishy Avenue. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 48, 2019Z-069PR-001, a request to rezone from CSCLOR20 and R6 to MULA zoning for various properties along East Trinity Lane. The staff recommendation is to disapprove as submitted and approve with removal of the seven parcels as identified in your staff report. Item 49 on page 16 of your agenda, 2019Z-071PR-001, request to rezone from R10 to MUL zoning for property located on Old Lebanon Dirt Road. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 50, 2019Z-072PR001, a request to rezone from IR to MULA zoning for property located on 16th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 51, 2019Z-073PR-001, request to rezone from IR to MULA zoning for property located on 14th Avenue North. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 52, 2019Z-076PR-001, request to rezone from IR to MULA zoning for properties on Houston Street. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item 54, 2019Z-079PR-001, request to rezone from R6 to RM20A zoning for properties located on Hyde Street and 24th Avenue North. The staff recommendation is to approve. And finally, under other business on page 17, item 58, accept, accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you, Sean. Commissioner, so on the consent agenda, uh, we have items number 3, 7A, 7B, 
15 a 15 b 17 19 20 21 23 25 27 oh i need to what about 24 is that i need to ask okay. we have some requests that that not be on consent okay so 25 27 33 35 36 37 38 39 40 42 44 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 54, and 58. That's correct. Okay, commissioners, you've heard those items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda? There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items have been passed on the consent agenda. So, to everyone viewing and watching and everyone here, uh, we'll, let, we'll let the crowd leave as quick as possible and then we'll get, we'll get just a minute to let everybody clear out. And so this leaves a lot of seats up front. If you're standing up, you can come on up. Lots of seats up front, so if you're standing in the back, come on up. Come on up. We got comfortable metro seats. <laughs> So that means that, commissioners, we will hear the following items and make sure I'm correct on these two so everybody knows. So we're going to be hearing items 5, 6, 8, 11, 12, 13, 18, 28, 29, 31, 34, 43, and 53. And 24. I believe that's correct. We'll be hearing 15 items tonight. So, item five. is a request to rezone property in the Madison area to request to rezone approximately two acres from single family residential to the sp specific plan to permit 28 multifamily residential units. Sorry. Yeah, let's, it, I, I don't think we can hear you very good. If you could scoot a little closer to the mic. There we go. Okay, this is his own change in Madison. So it's to go from single family to specific plan for 28 residential units. Property is outlined in red. This is just to the north of Amquay School. Um, and it's on the south side of Shannon Road. And this part of the area, there is most of the land in this spite are large lots and some of it is undeveloped. Staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all staff conditions. The existing zoning is single family residential. It permit up to 10 single family lots. This 
and it came out really small. This is the proposed specific plan. Again, it calls for 28 units. Max height is three stories and 35 feet. Units front onto Shannon Avenue, as well as a new public street that will be provided from north to south, provide for a future connection if the properties to the south ever develop. Uh, parking consists of some surface parking as well as uh, garage parking, sidewalks are provided on Shannon Avenue per the major, or per the collector's um, standards, or, I'm sorry, the local standards. And when it's developed, sidewalks will also be provided on the east side of the new street. This is in the Madison Community Plan. The policy is neighborhood evolving. It's intended to create and enhance suburban, suburban residential neighborhoods with more housing choice. As proposed, the SP is consistent with this policy. The site is located in close proximity to Gallatin Pike, which is a major <coughs> corridor and provides um, services for future residents, provides for more housing options, provides for a new public road, and a possibility for a future extension to the south when the property is developed. The inclusion staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions as the request is consistent with the policy. Thank you, sir. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Is the applicant in the room? Elite Nashville Development. Why don't we see if they're out in the hallway just to make sure. Thank you. Ma'am, do you have a question? Every time I've been here, will I be called to speak? I yes, ma'am. So here, just so everybody, uh, if you're uh, new, uh, uh, what we do first is we hear the presentation. We'll open the item for public hearing. Um, the applicant goes first to present uh, the applicant side of the story, and then we'll do um, folks that anybody who wishes to speak in favor of the project, and then will anyone wishing to oppose will oppose the project and then, uh, all right, so the applicant is, is not in the room, so anyone uh, in the audience wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Ma'am, are you here for this particular item? You are, are you in opposition? Yes. Oh, it's your turn. Come on. I didn't know if I thought I would be close. Stuff. You are. So what we do is everybody lines up on this particular item. You have two minutes to speak. Uh, and ma yes, ma'am, come on up and we'll give you. So the timer is right over here. And and uh, we appreciate you coming down. And That's then please state your name. Is, is this where I'm? Yep. Yes, ma'am. And I then will. Uh, state your name and your address for the record. Thank you for coming. We'll help you along. I will, and I saw my property up <laughs> My name is uh, Patricia Hankins. I live at 325 Sarver Avenue, and uh, this is a family property of four acres that goes all the way back to Shannon, which runs parallel to Sarver Avenue. And um, this has been like a little mini farm to our family from back in the late 30s. So we've had all kinds of animals and whatever there. And um, I actually helped uh, build the fence that is between the property there that adjoins what we're talking about today. Now, when I received a notice back in January, I called the Planning Commission and I talked to someone named Debbie, who was very, very, she was great. And uh, she said that we would not be contacted again if, we, if it was deferred, and it could be deferred just about any time. So went along with the deferral and all, and uh, as I'm thinking, I'm talking to some neighbors and whatever, and um, you know, I decided that we all prefer for the zoning to be left like it is, of course, things are changing. We do know that. And then we were told uh, that we would have 14 units, which is more than what we have, obviously. But when they first sold, when my friend first sold this property, um, I talked to a Bobby Hernandez who bought the property. And he told me just almost, ex is that all I have left? Oh. Oh, Keep going. Well, anyway, he told me that almost exactly what it would be for the 14 units, okay? Then I talked to um, Bill Pridemore. He told me that this plan could not be changed, so I didn't think about it much anymore. But I was 
well misinformed. And that's not the case. And it's a travesty that we're told one thing and we're looking at something entirely different. Double the 14 units. Thank you. And Appreciate in, you in the SP plan, everybody is considered but the property owner in the fact sheet. I studied it. And the property you, owner is not considered. And I would like it if we were to be. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Council, we'll, we'll get to you very last. That way you can, can go last. Um, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? I want to make sure we get everybody. Ma'am? All right. I don't see anyone else wishing to speak in opposition. And then the developer's not here. So, yes, Councilman, uh, come on up. Appreciate you coming down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'm Bill Pridemore, uh, currently Councilman representing District 9 in Madison, which uh, represents this area um, on Shannon and Sarber. Um, during the process, this has kind of been a, a long process. It's, uh, it's been deferred several times, and, 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 and I think it was initiated last year and then kind of slowed down. But I was in favor of this. Um, initially, and I thought once the uh, word got out and once the signs came up, and, and especially the amount of time that was involved in, the, in this process, if there was any opposition, I certainly would have, would have spoken to them in some fashion of, one, of another. Uh, I did have to speak to, I think, two people that I've had documented that uh, had some concerns. And I think where Miss um, uh, Miss Hankins uh, may may have gotten the information from up until um, I think it was last week when I was or two weeks ago, I wasn't even aware that it was had been doubled to uh, 28 units. However, I did show so, uh, some concern with that. Uh, but once I did, I spoke with uh, planning the planner uh, staff member. Um, I fully understand why, because the owners, and I'm, I hate to speak for them, but since they're not here, I'm, and I, I don't even know who they are, uh, but, but uh, they, from what I understand from staff, they're basically giving up a portion of their property in order to have a right-of-way, an easement for a, um, a public street. So I think by giving up some, giving that property up, I, I felt like they were justified in wanting to uh, increase the density of their project. Uh, I, I, again, I've been, um, I haven't received uh, any calls of the contrary. I haven't received any notification. So at this point, my plan was to uh, affirm and, and, and be in favor of the project. So I, that's what I'm asking for now. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. Good Thank to see you. Seeing no one else switching to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair, you want to go first? So, don't we sometimes have a process of deferral if there's some issues and the applicant's not here? Isn't that? Well, I think we uh, look at all of the facts mm -hmm. and determine if, you know, the one issue that might, I, I, we're, I know we're at the end of a council term, and so we need to make sure that it, you know, what the timing is, and I think Lisa can answer that. Um, sure, if it was deferred one meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, to the, um, the May 23rd meeting, it would, could still process within this council term. Um, it would be pushed from the July public hearing at council to the August, but it stood, could still be within this council term. Given the council member is not fully supportive, I, I mean, I don't know if that matters or not. No, I think he, he stated he was. he was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You are supportive. Okay. Yeah. Just not fully. Supportive. Just okay. Um, well, it definitely is a significant change to the existing character in that area, and I understand it is its own for neighborhood evolving, and so that's, you know. What, what's going to happen, um, but it does seem like there is an opportunity for a little bit more information gathering, and it might be nice to hear from the applicant, um, but I will listen to others. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, I, 
actually don't have a problem with this development. Um, it seems, you know, like um, uh, Jessica said, it, the, the, uh, it is a neighborhood evolving. Um, it seems like it fits within what the um, uh, policy would say. I, I like, you know, just how it fits into the neighborhood. It promotes walkability. I just kind of underline that. But I am generally in support of it. I think the diversity is good. And uh, it seems like it would match as kind of where we're planning for that to go. So I have no problem with it. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, so just to pick up what the neighbor was speaking about, about the 14 to 28 units, when was it, when were the neighbors notified that it was going from 14 to 28? Okay, so um, it did originally come in for 14, and after looking at uh, the area, uh, staff felt that this was an appropriate location to provide a connection from north to south to provide future. So once you build a public road, 14 units obviously was not going to offset the cost. So we worked with them on a design, and we, and we spent a lot of time working with them. So once they came out um, with this plan, it was re-advertised because it was an increase in density. So, oh, so it was re-advertised. There was a second notice that went out after that, so, um, but it has been deferred several times, but there was a second notice for 28 units. Okay, well that's helpful. So, um, it sounds like the neighbors would have gotten notice that the, the uh, density was increasing from 14 to 28. It does seem like a noticeable, I mean, an extreme jump, right, from nine single family residential units to 28. I understand the, um, the rationale behind it, it makes sense financially to double the units if you're going to give up a large portion of your property for the right of way. But if I was a neighbor there, I probably would have an issue going from 9 to 28, even if there is a rationale behind it. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not fully sold on the project. It would be nice to hear um, from the applicant, of course, for them to explain a little more. Um, and unfortunately, they're not here. Um, I'm interested in hearing the other commissioners' comments. Commissioner Yellen. Uh, I actually do like the project, I, I, but I have similar concerns, just feeling slightly uninformed about um, kind of how the project arrived at this point. Um, maybe the, the councilman can talk a little bit more about the process, and did you feel like that the, the neighbor, I know that they were notified, but in terms of kind of the, the interaction the developer had with the neighbors, that that was fully vetted and, and the information you got from the neighborhood was, you felt like that they had time to respond and digest what was proposed? Uh, Councilman, come up to the microphone. We appreciate it. So I have a little back problem. No, that's okay. Uh, uh, that's a good question, Commissioner. I. Uh, as far as outlets and, and the information actually getting to the, to the neighborhood, uh, most of the information about that I actually uh, learned was through uh, social media, so through Facebook, Facebook and through uh, a uh, a uh, page web page uh, for the Madison residents. So I think it was publicized enough. Now, whether the uh, communication between the developer and the community, I, I can't. I suggested that in the beginning, and uh, uh, when I spoke to him on the phone and uh, reiterated that on, on a couple occasions, but uh, uh, as far as, I, I, can't, I can't tell you whether there was enough communication between he and the um, uh, community. I planned on, uh, naturally, if there was uh, some issue that uh, we would have a community meeting, but with no, uh, no opposition coming my way other than the two calls, they were more inquisitive than negative, and there was one on social media that I'm not, not sure uh, where he lived, uh, whether it was a legitimate uh, uh, complaint. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. I mean, I, I, I would just take that as a general positive response from the neighbors. That, that's, and know. that's the way I took it, yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilman? Yep. Yeah. Commissioner? Commissioner Gall? No, me. One. I, um, yeah, I'm a little concerned about you know, adequate communication on this thing. I mean, it is a big jump. Uh, the uh, I do understand the logic. I think the plan's a good approach. 
but it would be nice to hear from the developer and that's just kind of where I'm and find out really how much the neighbors knew and when they knew it. But that's just me. I'm supporting. Mr. Sims. I think uh, planning at its best is conversations between the neighborhood, the elected official, and the developer, and that conversation can't be had here, and there's a lot of questions from us. I do not take silence from a neighborhood to be approval. I think it often is not purely a lack of knowledge of how to participate in our democratic processes. So I'm, I'm for deferring this until we can get a conversation with uh, everybody involved. Thank you. So now we're, any other discussion? We'll need a motion. Well, I guess I'm, I'm still also, I guess, even just thinking about the numbers, we have, we're at, we're recommending the right of way for the road, but the road's not going to get developed until a later point in time. No, it would be, it would be developed with this development. It would be a portion of the road. Do you see that ah, north south? Yes. On the west side is actually a new public road. Okay. Yeah, that would be built as a part of this development. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? We need a motion. I'll make a motion. All right, Commissioner that, Sims. That we defer this um, specific plan until we, for one meeting, so that we can still meet the council uh, calendar so that we can have a conversation with the developer. That's a proper motion. Second. There's a second. Any other discussion? All in favor of a, any other discussion? I want to make sure. All right, seeing no other discussion, all in favor of deferral, one meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? Ayes have it. It's deferred one meeting. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. Thank you. All right, item number six. item on this evening's agenda is item number six, a Pettus Road Specific Plan. This is a request to rezone from AR2A to Specific Plan Residential to permit 103 multifamily residential units. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The site is located at Pettus Road unnumbered, unnumbered at the northwest eastern corner of Old Hickory Boulevard and Pettus Road. The site contains a total of 38.49 acres. The site is currently zoned AR2A, which requires a minimum lot size of two acres and is intended for uses that generally occur in rural areas. Um, again, this site is located at Pettus Road and the intersection of Old Hickory Boulevard. This site fronts the eastern portion of Pettus Road, which spans the site uh, running from north to south. The water feature you see is Indian Creek. The policy for the site is conservation and T3 suburban neighborhood evolving. The suburban neighborhood evolving policy is intended to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods with more housing choices and improved connectivity. Conservation policy is intended to preserve environmentally sensitive land features through protection and remediation. And in this instance, the conservation policy identifies some areas of steep slopes which are in excess of a 20% grade. The site plan calls for a maximum of 143 multifamily residential units. You will note that the site plan that the units are in fact detached from each other. Of the overall 38.49 acres, seven acres will remain as open space, including areas such as creeks, the required stream buffers, and steep slopes. A 40-foot setback along Pettus Road will contain a C landscape buffer and will provide screening for this site from the surrounding area. An internal walking trail network is proposed as a means of pedestrian travel throughout the site, um, which is identified by the green dashed line on the site plan. A proposed public street connection to Pettus Road will provide access to the site. All streets within the site will be public streets constructed to the standards of Metro Public Works. The Eastern Street Connection will extend the local street network to the pre previously approved Evergreen Hills SP. A future street connection is indicated by a stub street to the north property line. 
Sidewalks along Pettus Road will be constructed to meet the standards of the major and collector street plan, which requires an eight foot wide grass strip and a six foot wide sidewalk. Sidewalks will be constructed along all internal streets consistent with the local street standard, which requires a four foot grass strip and a five foot sidewalk. The plan also includes architectural standards pertaining to primary entrances, glazing, and building materials. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve the conditions and disapprove without all conditions as the plan is consistent with the policies on site. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up. Welcome back. <laughs> you know the rules. We've, you get 10 minutes and you can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Okay. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Um, good evening. It's Tiffany K. Park. Um, I'm the consultant, planning consultant for this project, and I live at 2940, do I need my address? All right, 2940 Baby Ruth Lane, um, Unit 5, Antioch, Tennessee, 37013. And so, yes, we're here um, presenting the Pettus Road SP. Um, we have actually had many, many meetings <laughs> with the community here. We've been engaging um, the Cane Ridge um, Community Club and neighbors um, since March of 2018, and um, feel like we have addressed a lot of their concerns, and we're continuing conversations with them as well as we move forward into second reading. Um, so since March 2018, we've addressed their concerns regarding density, design, and preservation. Um, so one thing I want to point out is that the plan, we worked really hard to make sure that we were following the T3 neighborhood evolving uh, policy as well as the conservation policy. Um, one of the things we heard very strongly early on was no multifamily. So um, although it says that in the uh, staff report, these are all single family units. Um, initially, there were townhomes that were proposed, but we took those out because the neighbors said that they did not want to see any multifamily or townhomes in this development. So it's all single family. Um, there are a variety of housing types still. There are some alley loaded product. There are some front loaded product. Um, there is some one story master down product to promote aging in place. So we thought through that. Um, the plan also includes, as the staff report said, a greenway system that connects, um, allows for walkability throughout this project, but then also connects with sidewalks that will hopefully connect to other developments um, to either side of us. Um, we're also continuing to work with the neighbors. Um, we got comments at the last meeting about materials, so we're putting in additional items in terms of materials that will be used in the SP um, to ensure that they get the type of design that's you know worthy of the market in this area. Um, we're improving infrastructure. Our traffic engineer is here if you have any questions for him, but um, we're doing improvements at the Pettus Road and Old Hickory Boulevard inter intersection there. Um, and then finally, I think what's most significant and important is that it is an SP. Um, I think this area has had uh, a lot of zone changes and subdivisions that have been approved that the community had not had input on in the past. And so we've had extensive conversations with the community over the last year, um, eight meetings and counting, I will say, because we're going to continue to com meet with them. Um, but this is an SP, and so what the community has worked through and what we're proposing is what we're hoping to approve, and that will be locked in for them. So um, with that, I'll reserve some time um, to respond to any comments. You have two minutes for rebuttal. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Hi. Twanachuk, 5967 Cane Ridge. I, I wish we had a choice other than support or uh, not because it's more just comments. We have had several really good meetings. We started out with some very contentious uh, meetings and everybody has worked to keep moving forwards on this. And I sent you an email, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. I just wanted to add to it that one of the big sticking points for us now is not with the developer. It's with the rules and such that are imposed by the Planning Commission, specifically the traffic requirements. We very strongly feel that putting a traffic light in the heart of Cane Ridge is inconsistent with the rural character of Cane Ridge. And so we are asking for your help on this and others as we push back on that, and we're trying to do something that is more fitting with the rural character. We do not want traffic lights in the middle of Cane Ridge. Options that have been floated are things like the roundabouts. Uh, there's already one planned in 
in the area, so it would kind of work well to have some others going through. Um, and that is all that I have to say on it this evening. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Anyone else? Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, since there is only a yes or a no, a support or oppose, uh, I have to say I'm opposed, but only until we document all the things that we've been talking about for the last eight months. Uh, fortunately, uh, the process has been good. We have an excellent council member, council member Bedne, who allows the process to occur and encourages people to come out and participate. So that's extremely helpful. Then we had a smart consultant as well, somebody who's been around here for quite some time. And then you had organized neighbors who have been going through this for years and years. They've been going through it for 30 years. That's how long I've been working with the Cambridge Community Club. The problem we've run into really isn't so much a developer citizen issue, it's the, really a need for more tools, things that we can use to craft a community that fits the desires of this community. You have in your packets four pages of assets that we have identified in Cambridge community uh, that are assets that we're asking all developers to consider as they initiate the process. But we need your help. We need your help in, uh, with, with staff time um, to help add to some of the excellent for-profit architects and uh, developers and property owners that I've already been in conversation with. We need support to create a community of Cane Ridge, a, a, a community plan for Cane Ridge. Uh, and the second item we need on top of that then is a rural character overlay of some sort that will help guide an organized development for what is thousands and thousands of acre out there. I, I have no idea what it totals, but we're talking about I-24, on one side, Bell Road on another side, Nolansville Road on another side, and the county line uh, on the back side. So it could be tens of thousands of acres, I don't know. Um, but we need your help in doing that. This project, we're in the f process of getting things finalized and put down on paper so it could be enforced both by metropolitan government and then by a corporation that we're creating to uh, allow for civil actions. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, the applicant, we have two minutes for a vote. And then we'll ask the councilman if he wants to go last, probably. Okay. Sure. So I just wanted to um, um, kind of clarify and, and further explain, explain what John Stern was talking about. So the developer um, has been meeting with, we've, we've met with the larger community, we've met with, you know, abutting property owners, and some things that they've asked for include things like, you know, fencing, um, and just other items that are very important to them in order to make this comfortable for them. And so they just wanted to have something in separate writing between the developer and the property owners. And so we're working through through that. So we do have a memo that's on the developer's letterhead. And so I think getting something solid and you know enforceable um, between the property owners and the developer is what we're working through. So. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Councilman, you want to go, we'll go, just go, la you want to go last, right? You're our last. This is, would you like to go now? Yes, sir. Councilman. Thank you. So what can I say? <laughs> this is indeed been a long process. And uh, uh, when we started it, I had told the developers that that was it, that we were not going to move forward uh, because I, that's what I do. I mean, I, you guys will never see here a project that I that didn't get vetted by the community. Now, the thing that I'm excited about is that the community has, uh, uh, and I have supported a, a community effort, a grassroots effort, to for them to figure out what type of development, how do they want to interact, and how do they want to grow or not grow 
uh, the Cambridge area, which is very rural, but, but it also has the opportunity for some development. So I kind of decided to take a step back and kind of look over the shoulder and see, encourage them and support them, but, but putting it on them to, to manage this project, the interaction with the developer. And it, it's been really a good process, uh, I think. Uh, like uh, they were saying, we are not there yet, but I will handle that at the council uh, as we move forward. But I think uh, you should be proud to uh, to uh, see uh, a success story uh, on uh, interaction between the development community and the community where you really, as a developer, you can talk to the people and you can actually develop a, a part of the community if you engage with the community and, and get them to be partners instead of looking at them as like uh, somebody you have to deal with. So I will ask you to please uh, support this, uh, but I'll, I'll listen and see if you guys have any questions for me. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Lyle, you want to go first? I, I applaud the uh, the effort that was made um, as part of this process. It's, I think it's it's uh, been um, well represented. So applaud both sides for doing that. Um, and I also thought the comment that was made about sort of a broader vision for the area was was a good one. And the thing that that I noticed when looking at this plan was the connectivity is, uh, I see the attempt to, to connect the streets, but I, I would like maybe staff to comment on that thought process is, is a larger development like this is, is proposed, kind of what the, um, for all of our benefits, what the, the process is for thinking about connectivity, both streets and otherwise. Who wants to take Sure. So I think we usually start by um, looking at the broader context, sort of what streets, what the street network is like in an area. Um, are there major collectors or arterials? Um, and then we look for surrounding developments that may have already been approved. Um, so if there are street connections that were clearly intended to be made on the uh, perimeter of the site, um, we look for those. We also look to the major and collector street plan, um, which identifies future um, corridors that are important um, for the overall connectivity of the county. Um, and we sort of take all of those factors together and then look at the unique conditions of the site um, and try to figure out the best way um, to make those um, planned connections and provide good circulation, both interior and exterior, to the site um, while respecting whatever the, the unique um, topography or other elements of the site might be. Is that it, Commissioner? Commissioner Blackshear? Um, my first question is, well, to steal the councilman's um, phrase, this definitely looks to be a planning success story, so I do applaud everyone who's involved in this. Um, my first question is, um, based on the applicant's statements about this not being um, a multifamily development, we have as our first condition that um, this would be a multifamily residential unit. Would that condition be changed? Um, so, there are a couple of different ways that ownership can be established. It can be established either through what is called a horizontal property regime where someone essentially owns their lot, but the surrounding property is under common ownership of the organization. Or then you can do it by fee simple lots, like a subdivision. Um, in this case, uh, I believe the intent is to do a horizontal property regime, which so because they would be multiple units on a single lot by the zoning code definition, it is multifamily. Okay. Now you'll notice condition number two, we have written in the possibility that it could be divided by a subdivision or by a horizontal property. And so while it's technically multifamily, um, and if you wanted to, you could modify condition number one just to say 143 detached multifamily, which would give some assurance to the community to that, that it would be in a single family form. Sure. I think that's a good idea. I mean, it doesn't sound like the applicant would be against adding that detached phrase in there, since that's what you're planning. Can you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. I suggested that the condition number one, where it says permitted uses shall be limited to a maximum of 143 multifamily, the word detached could be added, 103 mul detached multifamily, yeah. and that would give some, um, some um, because multifamily can take multiple forms, it's just more than three units on an individual lot, and so that 
could give some assurances. I think it would just make it clear, which would be helpful. The applicant also spoke about materials that would be used for the development. Is that something that would be appropriate to put in a, a condition? I'm not, it doesn't sound like that's a big sticking point, I guess, between um, the neighbors. Maybe it is, I don't know. But would that be something appropriate to include in a condition? Generally, some of those architectural type requirements are included on the plan. Um, I, I was going to ask Patrick if, if that's already included on the plan. He may want to speak to it, and so the plan is incorporated as part of the... So we do have our standard SP conditions, which is windows orientation, percentage of glazing for front facades, uh, prohibited materials, vinyl siding, EFIS, uh, things like that. Raised foundations would be required. However, we typically aren't as specific as... Um, you know, all brick. I mean, sometimes working with applicants, depending on the location and policy, um, working with neighbors, we can get to that level of specificity. But on this plan, we have our standard conditions. Okay. Well, it sounds like um, the conversation is continuing and that um, there are going to be agreements between um, the developer and others. And then obviously the councilman is still working. So that's, I mean, that's fine. I think the level of detail may not be required for the plan, so that's fine. My last question regards to or relates to the traffic light that the neighbor was speaking about. Um, what does traffic have to say about the addition of a traffic light versus a roundabout when this number of units are being added? We can ask Public Works. I think they're here. Yep, Public Works is here. You'll just state your name and department. We appreciate you coming. Um, Beverly Amaral, um, Metro Public Works, traffic engineer. Um, a signal is not um, conditioned for this particular project. There are several projects that have been previous, previously approved, Evergreen Hills, and I believe that there is a signal in this area. Um, the main traffic flow right now is Pettis to o OHB, Old Hickory Boulevard. So it's like this. And um, it's going to be a difficult um, intersection to decide how to control. Perhaps a roundabout does make more sense, but until we get the property that is right at that intersection where we know how much right of way we can get it's it's to be determined how that traffic control will need to be there's a lot of tra a, a lot of projects in the general vicinity that will be sending traffic on this route um, but we also have some changes coming through with a new interstate ramp in the Century Farms area. The it, it, traffic may redistribute a little bit differently in this area. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Uh, I guess my question is, are there any hard and fast rules about when a light would be required, or is it just a general facts and circumstance? We'll see when we get there. I mean, it sounded like the neighbor wanted to have some ability to contribute to the conversation with Public Works about how um, they would like their neighborhood to look, if possible. So I, I guess my question is, will that be possible for a neighborhood conversation, or is there a definitive hard and fast rule that a traffic light must be required if X number of units are added. It's it's not based on the units. It's based on the the traffic flow and the signal warrant analysis. And there will be counts, traffic counts taken to see if you if it qualifies for a signal. Um, there may be, like I say, a, a better solution, like a roundabout. Um, the uh, it's. We prefer to have six to eight hours of peak hour traffic, you know, not just in the a.m. and in the p.m. to install a signal. Um, you know, if you, we end up having a lot of um, development at that intersection and sidewalks and a lot of pedestrian activity, 
then perhaps a signal makes more sense in order to have a um, pedestrian signals to help people cross the street. Thanks. But there are guidelines on when we would consider a signal. I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, anything else? Commissioner Tibbs. Uh, my, all my questions have been answered. I support this. Vice Chair. Um, I guess I just had one question. Maybe it's, I was looking back through our comments, but um, they, the uh, neighbor referenced the Cane Ridge Resource Declaration page and wanted that to be part of the record. Is that something we've seen or? Um, no, we may have to ask legal about whether it's a, it's it's in the packet. It's in the packet. On your desk. On your desk. Oh. I didn't have that packet. Is that it? Oh. It says draft. Okay. Um. This is the first time I've seen this document, uh, I, but if it's, I guess it's, if it's purporting to be an agreement between the developer and the community, um, it, it wouldn't be enforceable by the metropolitan government. It essentially would be a private agreement, or agreement between two private parties, and they would enforce it. Um, at their will, however they so choose, but the metropolitan government would not be a party to it and, and would um, take steps to enforce any portion of the agreement, even if it is a part of the record today. Okay. Tonight. Okay. And it's like a petition, we'll enter, we, we all have it, we'll enter it in the record, staff has it. Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't think I have any other questions, I just, I, you know, there's a lot of development. The councilman knows this well, and as we keep seeing these areas of our county get built up faster and faster and no infrastructure is going to be an issue, I just hope that somehow we're tracking that. <laughs> Commissioner Sims. Uh, I want to thank everybody involved. Uh, unless you've done neighborhood organizing, the work that y'all pulled off is unbelievably hard and takes a lot of effort. And the fact that y'all met eight times, my hat's off to everybody, in particular the developer. I wish all of our developers were willing to spend that much time really working. And y'all have come up with some things that are really important issues. My question is, um, Councilman Benet, when you say you can handle this at the council, there are some things they want to make sure they get that's not in the um, conditions yet. Is that, are those things that you will handle? I'm not sure what mechanism, if any, we need to be involved in making sure that that gets done. Councilman. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I need to make sure that whatever final product is there is something that I can be proud of putting my signature down. So I'm going to continue looking over this uh, process. For example, I'm going to add language in the SP saying that they cannot have short-term rentals, for example. That's one of the things that I do on uh, on SPs. So that's I'm going to handle that at the council level. Uh, but there are things, tweaks that can still be incorporated. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm asking for you all to uh, support what you see today and uh, being that they are uh, taking a leap of faith, the, uh, the both sides, that yeah. you let, give me a chance to continue steering this on uh, and hoping that we'll get to a good resolution. Very good, thank you. Um, the other thing that they brought up, which is not particularly part of this case, but is something that I'm hearing over and over again from this part of our county is, there really isn't a big plan for Cane Ridge yet, and I know that our staff is, oh my gosh, I mean, the workload they're under with staff cuts during the last two budget cycles, not additions. Um, I don't know how we can push anymore. I do know it's on the list of things to do, but when they can get there is they're running with their tongues hanging out. So I just want to go on record here that we understand that that's a real need, and there's a lot of development going on. So I think we're, as a commission, are pushing our staff as much as we can humanly do and still respect their workload. So um, I like this plan. I very much like the way the community work together. That's, that's, how, that's how our city as it grows should be doing, so. Commissioner Gottel? 
Um, I think the councilman, the community, and the developers all work well together. It looks like the system works. I support it. Commissioner Moore. So I would like to move approval, um, amending condition one to add detached and uh, detached multifamily that's residential a, units. That's a proper motion. Sorry. There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And is passed with the one change on condition one. We are now on item eight. Agenda is item eight. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to RM15A and RM20A. Staff's recommendation is to approve. The site is located at the corner of Marshall Street and Meridian Street. Existing site conditions include two single family houses on two parcels. The site is located in the large area of RS5 zoning. Adjacent zoning districts include commercial limited, commercial service, and specific plan residential. The site is in the Urban Neighborhood Evolving Policy Area and the Highland Heights Supplemental Policy Area. Both policy areas encourage greater housing choice and improved connectivity. This site is located within the R4 subdistrict of the Building Regulating Plan in the Highland Heights Study Supplemental Policy Area, which is intended to enhance neighborhoods with greater housing choice and improved connectivity. The R4 subdistrict supports a level of intensity that includes building types such as Plex House, House Court, and low, ride, and low rise townhomes. The proposed zoning request is consistent with the building regulating plan, of the R, which is which this site is located in the R4 subdistrict. The RM15A and RM20A zoning districts provide design, sta design standards that will enhance the character of the neighborhood when redevelopment occurs in this location. Where access to the site will be provided from an existing improved alley on one of the parcels. Rezoning these parcels to RM15A and RM20A will provide an opportunity for the site to provide additional housing choices within the immediate area, support existing transit service, and improve the pedestrian realm where development occurs. Given the aforementioned, staff recommends to approve. Thank you, sir. And we'll go ahead and open this item for public hearing. The applicant has 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 for Burba. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 1806, Allison Place. I'm representing the owners uh, with this request. We are requesting to rezone the property in a manner that we feel is consistent with the Highland Heights community plan. Uh, we're asking for two zoning districts uh, so as to create a transition as the property wraps around the corner uh, and, and goes from the Meridian Street corridor uh, and, again, wraps around to the Marshall Residential Street. Um, as, as important to the, uh, as expressed as important by the Highland Heights Community Plan, uh, infrastructure uh, is needed to support new development. And in this case, we feel like we've got the infrastructure here. We've got an alley on the south side of the property uh, with the zoning districts that we are requesting uh, will be required to use that alley for access. Additionally, with any uh, new development, we will be required to uh, enhance infrastructure, and that includes sidewalks along both streets. Um, it will also include improvements to water and sewer lines as well as stormwater management on this property. Um, we are asking for an A district and as the staff uh, expressed to you, the A district sets up for stronger urban design on the property. Uh, the use of the A district helps create walkable neighborhoods. It puts buildings up, homes up closer to uh, the sidewalks that will be constructed. Parking will have to be located uh, in the rear. Uh, the zone change that we're asking for does provide additional housing choice in this neighborhood. Uh, that additional housing choice supports transit. Uh, there is a bus line that runs up and down, or sorry, down Meridian Street. So additional housing here will support that transit investment that Metro's made. Uh, it also supports the viability of the Dickerson Corridor as well as the Trinity Corridor to the north by putting more households within either a short drive or walking distance to future commercial. Uh, um, 
We have talked to a fair number of neighborhoods in the surrounding uh, Highland Heights neighborhood. We've gotten a lot of support. Uh, also, we, we um, in addition to the notices that we sent out for this request, we uh, sent out postcards advertising a community meeting. We had that community meeting. Uh, we sent those notices out to property owners within 600 feet of this site. Uh, we had the community meeting yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, only a small number uh, attended, but again, it was advertised. Uh, we'd had a healthy discussion, and uh, it seemed like we had support for our request on this site. Um, as most of you know, a lot of people bled over that Highland Heights community plan uh, process, and uh, there was consensus at the end of the day uh, that this uh, is what we wanted to see. We wanted to see healthy corridors and transitions away from the residential area, and our request we feel is consistent with everything that's expressed in the Highland Heights community plan. So with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you, and then we'll reserve two minutes for your rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Seeing no in support, seeing no one in, are you for support? Support, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were calling me up. No, support. <laughs> Welcome. I am in support. Oh, you are? Yeah. Well, come on up. <laughs> I'm completely confused. I know it's a huge shock to everyone in this room. Uh, <laughs> my fault. I know how this game works. I know how this new rules work. So my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. Uh, I do reside at 1826 Story Circle, which is just a couple of streets away. Uh, Mr. Cuthbertson did hold a meeting yesterday. There were five neighbors uh, in attendance, including myself. For this particular property, uh, it does adhere to the, um, the neighborhood study and our general plan. And I would like to add my support as chairperson of the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association to this particular plan, simply because he has taken all the steps necessary to make sure he's within the construct of what is intended for that particular street with the existing alley, the fact that it's on a corridor, um, the fact that it's at a major intersection. Um, we do stand in support of this. I do specifically. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else support? Come on up. Good evening, my name is Jessica Williams. I just want to stand in support of this project. I do a lot of work in the Highland Heights area, had an opportunity to, to be a part of the neighborhood study, so I'm excited to see that this will be a great housing opportunity for more choices in the Highland Heights area. And then just stay here, address. Uh, 2115 Yeaman Place. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else speaking in support? Seeing that, anyone speaking in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. And just give us your name and your address. My name is Amanda Hodgins, and I live at 1814 Meridian Street. I'm downhill from everything. I take in all of the storm water. So that's my complaint. My concerns is that they are able to control their storm water because I can't control anymore. My home is already destroyed from storm water. Uh, it white caps in my backyard. It busts the front of my foundation out front. That's all I have to say is if we can just control the storm water. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down. Anyone else speaking to opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal. Stacy's in support. No, uh, in all seriousness, um, uh, we have had a lot of communication and we'll continue to have communication with the neighborhood as we move forward through council. Um, with regard to stormwater, when we redevelop this, regardless of how it's zoned, we have to comply with stormwater um, requirements. With multifamily, there's a lot more scrutiny on stormwater, and so we will definitely have to treat, detain, retain stormwater with the site. As it relates to Ms. Hudgens' property, we're fortunate there's a crest to the north of this. She's on the other side of that crest, so we go away from her, so there won't be any direct immediate impact to, to her property. So. Thank you, sir. I didn't see the councilman. I want to make sure I didn't see. All right. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Sims. I cannot believe that I'm actually hearing Stacy say this. So thank you, Mr. Gordon, for one, leading, helping to lead this whole plan that has led us to something that's really good and that the neighborhood actually sees how it fits and um, and that y'all were involved in it and the, the developer listened to you, so I, I'm, I, I'm just delighted. Commissioner Gobble? I'm for it. Commissioner Moore? Yep. Councilman? Commissioner Elam? Commissioner Blackshear? Um, 
I appreciate what the applicant said about the stormwater um, protections and that they would be stronger, presumably, uh, with the multifamily residential zoning. And so hopefully we get that right. And um, sounds like maybe uh, the neighbor's home might not be directly impacted because of the positioning of the property. But if the stormwater regulations were not properly adhered to, someone definitely would be. So I'm confident that Metro Stormwater will make it happen. Commissioner Tibbs, Vice Chair. Like others, I get nervous when I see the, the upzoning to RM20 in this neighborhood, but um, I'm glad to hear that it's been accepted by the, by the neighborhood, um, and I will make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a sec second? Any other discussion? Seeing that, all in favor of the project, say aye. Aye. Those no, ayes have it, and it's approved. We are on item 11. is a request to rezone properties at 1500 Bell Road and Old Hickory Boulevard from AR2A to RM15 multifamily residential zoning on approximately 34.57 acres. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. The 34.57 acre site includes two vacant parcels south of Bell Road, uh, northeast of Old Hickory Boulevard. The eastern parcel, parcel 113, is located on the south side of Bell Road, and then the western parcel 110 is located um, southwest of, um, to the southwest and is separated from Bell Road uh, by approximately 750 feet um, and, and several properties north of parcel 110. The site contains heavy vegetation and steeper slopes towards the center of the site, and a stream bisects uh, the center of the site as well. The site is zoned AR2A. The surrounding area south of Bell Road includes primarily single family and vacant properties with scattered institutional and two family uses along Bell Road and Old Hickory Boulevard. The site is located in the T3 neighborhood evolving and conservation policy areas. Conservation policy is identified uh, near the center of the site, recognizing a stream, steep slopes, potential wetlands, and associated uh, stormwater regulation buffers. The area within conservation policy, uh, the areas within conservation policy bisect the center of the site from the unencumbered areas located around the periphery of the site um, in T3 neighborhood evolving policy. The areas within T3 neighborhood evolving policy may support new residential development. However, given the environmentally constrained areas located central to the site, the feasibility of ensuring a sensitive design that preser preserves a natural landform while also achieving the goals of the neighborhood evolving policy for diverse housing options and enhanced connectivity may be limited. Additionally, the density permitted by the proposed zoning district may result in development that is too intense given the site's limited access to Bell Road uh, and potentially conflicting with the regulations and controls of Metro Stormwater and Metro Fire. Parcel 110, or sorry, Parcel 113 has approximately 300, and, uh, 300 feet along the frontage of Bell Road, and Parcel 110 is landlocked, located away from any existing public infrastructure. Development on the western parcel is premature until parcels abutting the site to the north, which are shown uh, with asterisks on the screen, um, are included um, along Bell Road, can be part of an overall development plan um, that provides public road connectivity to the surrounding area, and therefore staff recommends disapproval. Thank you very much. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up. You have 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 for both. Yes, we would like to save a few minutes. State your name and address. Right? I'm Troy Gardner. I am a landscape architect with Reagan Smith Associates, 315 Woodland Street. Um, uh, we have a presentation also, if you don't mind. So I believe she's oriented you to where the site is. It's uh, the south side of Bell Road between Nolensville Pike and I-124. 
or I'm sorry, I-24. Okay, uh, yeah, that's good. Oh, it'll be a couple of slides, yeah. Go back one, please. Um, so yeah, you can see this site is uh, currently zoned AR2A, um, as well as has a conservation overlay in the central portion of the site, which is the green area. Um, and is also in the T3 neighborhood evolving uh, community plan. Uh, so there's basically four main objectives with that um, plan, and that's to provide greater housing choice, higher density, um, environmental sensitivity, and improved connectivity. And we believe that the RM15 zone would uh, have a greater opportunity of achieving these goals than the current AR2A zone. Uh, and so to briefly touch on each of those, um, the current zoning only allow, has a minimum lot size of two acres, um, so relatively low zone, uh, low density rather. Um, the RM15 would provide a greater um, amount of density. Uh, it, it allows 15 units per acre there. Um, so obviously that would be more in keeping with what this policy uh, recommends. Um, additionally, there's greater housing choice with this zone. The AR2A uh, only proposes single family, two family, and mobile home, whereas the RM15 would allow single family, two family, multifamily, elderly housing, and boarding house. Um, with respect to the environmental sensitivity of this development, um, that's going to be the case regardless of what zone uh, that it is. There, she is correct. Uh, there's another slide if you don't mind. Uh, one more, please. Here we go. Um, so here you can see we have done a slope analysis. So the uh, yellow areas are 20 to 25 percent slope. The orange areas are 25 and above. Um, so there are areas on this side that do have some pretty intense slopes um, as well. We've identified the streams, uh, wetlands, and wet weather conveyances and are showing there in blue. Uh, what buffers would be required on those. So we are aware of uh, these constraints. Um, however, if you'll continue. Uh, one more, please. Um, this is kind of just taking it and making it a simpler um, exhibit here. You can see in the center portion would be the area that would be the conservation overlay area that would need to be preserved and not touched. However, there would be uh, portions on either side, of, you know, the east and west of the site that would be more suitable for development and would allow, um, you know, an opportunity to develop on this site. Um, and so the fourth and final point um, I wanted to make on the um, how we're addressing the community policy is the improved connectivity. Again, this is another issue that is going to be kind of regardless of which zone you're in, um, how you address it. Um, unfortunately, it is difficult for this site. Um, if you can go back to maybe the second slide. There you go. Um, Given the topography of this site, it is difficult uh, to make a connection. However, a uh, previously approved SP, uh, you can see Forest Hill, or Forest View, excuse me, um, proposed and was approved a public road through the site, which is the orange dots. Um, so we believe that an extension of this road down to Old Hickory Boulevard, which is the dashed magenta line, that extension uh, could appropriately uh, be made and would satisfy the major um, and street collector plan. So this would give the site the connectivity that um, is proposed in the community policy. Right. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Tom White, 315 Dedrick Street. I also, along with Troy, represent the applicant in this case. There's a number of people here that are supportive, property owners and others. I'd just like to ask them to raise their hands so we can recognize them. I've not asked these folks to address the commission. Every one of them attended a neighborhood meeting. And at the front end, I want to start by thanking Councilman Fabian Bedney for the extensive neighborhood meeting that we did have, I can report to you that took place within the last two weeks. Uh, there was not one person that attended the meeting that was in opposition. Uh, a significant number of notices were sent out, uh, good dialogue, and again, the councilman took great time that evening, both in meeting at Reagan Smith when the matter first came up, at least on one occasion I was there, and on other occasions uh, out in the neighborhood and fielding a number of calls. But I would basically 
a comment here that uh, I, with all the respect for the staff, this is basically a soft disapproval and you've heard the four reasons articulated by Troy as to why it, it should be approved. But I wanna read specifically the staff comments because uh, what they say basically is some things might na need to be addressed. My comment is they should be addressed, but as a planning commission matter, it should be approved subject to different departments review. Here's the comment. The areas within the T3 policy may support new residential development. However, given the environmentally constrained areas located central to the site, the feasibility of ensuring a sensitive design that preserves the natural landform, which also, while also achieving the goals of the T3 neighborhood policy and improving connectivity, may be limited. So what they've said is that you've got to be sensitive to the areas down the center, both under the policy and the conservation overlay. That's exactly what's proposed here. You just saw the presentation by Reagan Smith. Those areas will totally be avoided, and the developments take place on the east and the west side. It says, additionally, the density permitted by the proposed zoning district may result in development that's too intense, giving the site's limited access to Bell Road, potentially conflicting with the regulations and controls of Metro Stormwater and Metro Fire. So again, it's if, potentially, if, potentially. The client's done a presentation, which was done these same slides shown at the neighborhood, shown in other meetings in, in the area, where it showed that they will stay out of that central area, which is so critical. Uh, and then the most, I think, telling is the staff comments are, may be affected by metro stormwater, metro fire, metro traffic. As a planning issue, it should be approved here subject to the scrutiny of those different departments. Uh, so in my opinion, from a planning perspective, it should be approved. I uh, appreciate the courtesy of the commission today. I uh, appreciate, again, the councilman's time and effort on this. But again, it's a very soft recommendation. Potentially this, maybe this, maybe that. And basically, Reagan Smith has said we'll address those things and we come in with any final plan. Thank you for your courtesies. Thank you, sir. You'll have, uh, applicant will have two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, you probably don't need a rebuttal. <laughs> Do you need a rebuttal, Mr. White? I want to make sure. We were too eloquent the first time. <laughs> too, you're way too. <laughs> and then, Councilman, you recognize. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I tend to agree uh, with Mr. White, uh, so I hope uh, the building doesn't collapse. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I will recommend that the commission approves the contingent to uh, the review by these departments uh, that he named. We did have uh, meetings, a meeting in the community. Uh, like I, every time I have a meeting, uh, people get a paper notice. Uh, it's also posted on my newsletter, on my Facebook, on my Twitter. So we, we try to make sure that we not only capture the immediate neighbors, but people that live further away. And at the meeting, there was no opposition. So this is something that clearly uh, the community around there wants. And the point is that part of the city is changing. Uh, the, perhaps at one point, people didn't want a more density. That's when the whole area was rural. Now it's people want to have more uh, of an environment, of a urban feel for that area. And I think when we finally ever get to the community plan review for Bell Road, that uh, it will show that that's the case. So uh, I'm obviously I'll, I'll wait for you guys to uh, go through the process, but I hope that you will uh, join me in doing this crazy thing of agreeing with Mr. White. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, will I declare the public hearing closed. How about we start with Commissioner Moore? You wanna go first? So, um, I agree with the councilman in looking the, at this. I was wondering, is there another way to go about it for approval, I guess, with the, the middle of the land being so um, basically unbuildable? What, are there other options? I, I, I have a hard time articulating my question, but. <laughs> Let me just speak generally to the neighborhood evolving policy. So when we're looking at um, the different policy areas, there are obviously various goals within those policies. Um, the um, evolving policy, of course, encourages a greater mix of housing, um, but it also encourages um, 
a greater um, level of connectivity. Um, and what we're looking at as staff in those instances would be um, setting up a network of, of public local roads. Um, so while we do have a planned collector to the east, we're also looking at ways to serve the greater evolving area through public roads and so I think one of the concerns that we had was the inability to kind of provide for that connectivity. Um, the uh, the plan, if, if rezoned, any plans would certainly be reviewed by all agencies to make sure that there's appropriate um, access for any individual developments that happen on the property and that the stormwater regulations um, are met and it would likely result in a traffic study and so there may be improvements that are required but we wouldn't know any of those things until such time that they came in to get a building permit, and at that point, we are out of that process. So if we approve today and some of those things didn't line up, then they couldn't build on it anyway, correct? Right. They would have to go through the building permit review process, which is a review by um, all agencies for um, fire, public works, stormwater, water services, uh, sewer, those um, agencies' uh, planning would not review again. Okay. That's all my questions right now. Commissioner Gobble. Um, yeah, this is a tough one. I, I certainly uh, understand where staff is coming from, and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with staff. At the same time, I, I think the process and the neighborhood and the councilman's support really does carry a lot of weight. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to listen to what the other commissioners have to say. Commissioner Sims. I'm always so hesitant to not back the, the staff because these things are so complicated that I really trust their, and the increase from 21 to 519 is, is so intense. I mean, I, I don't think in the two years I've been on this thing, I don't think I've ever seen that type of percentage of density. Um, and so a zone change without something, I mean, I would feel better if this were an SP or something, but, um, it, it scares me, so I'm going to support the staff. Vice Chair. So, because I'm the one that's always harping on making sure infrastructure keeps up with development, I am hesitant to approve a project where we already know there is a potential infrastructure deficiency. So I'm going to support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Tibbs. I'm kind of along uh, Commissioner Moore and Commissioner Gobble. Um, I feel like the process was well. I, I'm, I'm too wish there was a way we could get that um, area, the, as uh, Governor Ringenstein said, the conservation area. Just if we could make sure that that was definitely, um, you know, that you would not be developed. And I know it's undeveloped area, but um, if we put that zoning over all of it, it's just. Uh, you know, like Commissioner Sims says, that that is a, you know, it's a huge amount that can happen there. Um, the, and the connection, um, is that, um, I know the SP is there, but it was done as an SP. Is there, um, like, how do we know that's going to happen? I don't know. How, what's the best way of saying that? Because that, that is a lot, and if the, you know, the, the connect, connectivity is uh, it's very is a big question mark. Sure. So the Forest View SP, which is the SP that's to the east that you can see on this drawing with the dash line through it, that's actually in for a final site plan for um, I believe Phase One, and Phase One includes a good bit of that um, collector. Now, getting it getting getting it ultimately connected, of course, the way that we kind of have to do those things is that as individual properties come in, then we can work our way through and get those um, collectors built. Um, but the, a good portion of that is actually going to be built um, with the phase one of Forest View that's under review now. Um, it will be you know, dependent on other developments to the or other properties to the south to redevelop to kind of get the remainder of it, and that's that's just our best method of getting those collectors put in um, as developments come through. As it is now, there is um, there is connection. It's just those are those are just a small rural roads or two lanes. Um, well, the road to the north is an yeah. arterial. Mm -hmm. um, Bell Road it's to the north, it's an arterial, and then the road that the kind of the dash line that you see there to the east is the future collector that we're getting a piece of built soon. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, because of the way the community supports it I'm, and the, um, the, you know, the, I'll just say the housing diversity that it brings, it does something that I'm, I'm in supportive of. I do have those, I wish, I'm not sure if we could do that with, without making an SP, you know, being able to give them a little bit more, but I understand this is a different situation. Um, let me think about it a little bit more. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, so, uh, Attorney White mentioned the soft disapproval um, comment. Is is what is staff's position that this development or this zone change does not uh, fit within policy? Is it completely against policy, or in your opinion, it is not the best way to interpret the policy? I'm trying to figure out the, the staff's rationale. Sure. I think that what I would say is that when we're looking at the policy, um, as you all know, the policies cover um, large areas of differing types of property, and so the po policies are pretty broad. Um, and so when we're looking at the policies, there are often uh, multiple goals to be achieved, um, and so Sometimes it's kind of a balancing of how you meet those, all of those goals. Sometimes it's not possible to meet all of the goals, and so we try to get the best that we can get. Um, in this case, I think that there's clearly uh, a goal of um, diversifying housing and providing different housing types that are out there. There's also a goal of um, providing for connectivity. And so I think that uh, the staff saw it that on balance, um, we weren't able to kind of get to the connectivity piece, which we thought was um, important, but we do see value in diversifying housing. Does that so <laughs> what I'm hearing is you think that it meets policy, but it's not the most ideal um, zone change within the policy. Right. Well, and there are, there's also conservation policy, and so making sure that we're developing in a way that is sensitive to that conservation, which um, uh, should be achieved with the reviews of the other agencies, um, but without us having kind of a, a level of comfort on, on that conservation policy that, that kind of runs through and creates some challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you know, we're kind of trying to balance various <laughs> needs and desires and also what the community wants, but um, certainly it would be achieving uh, the goal of getting um, a diversity of housing. Sure. Um, it is a very awkward sight to see like the whole middle um, basically being uh, completely untouched because it's under that conservation policy. Um, and there is that connection problem. I mean, I, I think it's great that the neighbors like it and we're not having someone scream at us about the intensity of the zoning, because it is, I mean, quite stark. Um, I think I also have a soft disapproval. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I mean, the neighborhood seems to like it. Obviously, it does meet some goals with policy. Um, just the connectivity issue, um, I just can't get past. Commissioner Long. I'm curious, um, in terms of the, the middle part of the, the site, was there, how much thought did you all put into the connection within the site? And it was there concern about, um, disrupting that sensitive area just with the roads or how, even given the, the, the site plan that was presented? So um, staff didn't necessarily review the site plan as this is just a straight zone change and there's no um, guarantee that that would be the plan that would ultimately be developed. And so we have to kind of look at it about um, with what could be done under the existing zoning. But I do think that we certainly did consider that given that there is a very sensitive environmental feature in the middle that a crossroad that goes across the property, a cross public street that goes across the property may not be something that would be in the best interest of the community, but that there may need to be um, other public road connections that are made from either properties to the north or to the west. And so we're, it, you know, when we're looking at kind of these large areas of evolving, um, you know, it's a bit of a, a looking into the future and seeing what would be the, the best case scenario. Um, and so um, we are always trying to leave open the possibilities of connections. So, but, but understanding that a east-west connection across this property 
may be not the best um, case. So given it's the possible it's, it's not the Grand Canyon we're trying to cross here, but there, there's concerns, environmental concerns about crossing the site. Correct. Um, and with, with um, sensitive design could be mitigated um, with cross connection, good cross connection. Yeah, it, it may be, right. I mean, and, and, and going east-west may not be the best case scenario, but there could be other opportunities for connections from other properties, and so we try to keep the options open, but recognizing that there are challenges, we do have to look at the properties that are under review uh, while trying to keep a broad view of the entire evolving area. And so, and, may, and maybe this is not um, what we're reviewing, but uh, would the staff's position be that both of these parcels could be developed, even possibly with the proposed zoning, but the connectivity could be done so that you don't have to cross the center section. Yes. So we're not saying that this site is undevelopable. Correct. But we're saying that the proposal is obviously disapproved because of those concerns. Correct. Okay. Um, Was there a zoning proposed that you all were more comfortable with? No, I think this was the this was the proposal all along, and, and you know, of course, um, you know, sometimes I think that we wish that there was more property included in a proposal so that we could look at a broader range. And of course, that's not always possible um, because owners own what they own. And so, um, you know, I think that sometimes we're trying to keep a broad look, but of course the councilman also is trying to, to look at what his, uh, what his community is desiring in the area. Councilman. So I just wanted to uh, remind you that um, a couple of months ago, we uh, I had a different rezoning here on, uh, on the same road, and, and I brought to your attention that I had asked the planning staff to look at the community plan on issues like density and that sort of thing, and, uh, and I was uh, told that it will be uh, later on. So the, the reason why there is an inconsistency uh, and a discrepancy is because Unfortunately, our staff is underfunded. I mean, we don't have enough people to do these uh, community plans. But I don't think it's fair to uh, tell them I'll call them later. <laughs> there is, uh, I think, uh, it's not fair to penalize a, a property owner because we don't have the capacity to look at these community plans. And so I don't want to set any legal precedent by saying this. So I hope I, I don't make a mistake right now. But my point is, the when that community plan is done and adjusted, we are going to see that that's what people want. <coughs> they do want to see uh, a different bell road. They want to see uh, more density. They want to see something that looks more like Lenox Village uh, along the corridor with more housing, more uh, shopping opportunities, making a walkable community. And I think, uh, so I just wanted to put you at ease about the density part of it. That's uh, something that uh, when we talk about it on that road, it's never an issue uh, from people. Probably because Bell Road is a big avenue and there's already, uh, it, the cars are not cutting into, into the more rural part of the district, which is where people want to keep traffic out of. Uh, so that's, that's really the, the issue that I wanted to bring to your attention. If, if, uh, if density or change of density or increased density is a concern, I think I can tell you that I probably speak for people in that area when that, that doesn't seem to be a big concern. And then uh, again, and I have to say I agree with Mr. White, I think regulatorily as the different departments look at these issues, they are going to uh, not let them uh, go and, and dis uh, temper with that creek, for example. Or they are just going to be looking at all those issues and they're going to uh, look at the design that uh, whoever brings up the design and they're going to stop them. So, I mean, I I respect you guys a lot. I mean, I think uh, you all come from good places, so I don't want to, uh, I respect your whatever decision you guys make. We'll still be friends, eat pizza in the back and all that good stuff. But <laughs> I just wanted to share with you what I know about that property. So thank you. Ah, and that you actually join me 
in opposing the recommendation and voting for this. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. We'll need a, does anybody want to make a motion? I have one other question. Yeah. I, I feel like I should know this, but right, sure. so if we support the rezoning, what's the next step? Are we going to get a concept plan next? No, um, it would go straight to um, the codes and zoning examination for uh, building permit review and for construction plan review. Okay. Commissioner Gobble. Can I, can I ask a couple questions? Yeah, here? Um, yeah, we're still in discussion. Yeah, I, so if it goes through that process, and maybe we can ask the applicant, but I think the east-west connection, which we've discussed, the challenges that's going to go with that, it's got to be solved somehow, or they can't build on the left or the western portion. portion. They could build on the eastern portion. So, you know, I'm kind of inclined to say if they can't solve that, then they're only going to build on half this property right now anyway. And then for them to develop the western portion, <clears throat> that would have to be connected up somehow to probably Bell Road, uh, which to take Councilman Bedney's perspective, those parcels along that line, thing would have to kind of fall in line. So am I understanding that right? Is that kind of, so, you know, the thing is it's not going to get developed unless it's, they can figure out a good east-west connection, which my experience is going to be very costly. Um, <clears throat> or they, um, or they uh, connect to more property. I mean, that's, so I, I you know. It's, Lisa. Correct. So there are um, the various standards that they would have to meet from the um, reviewing agencies that would be involved in the building permit review, um, not the least of which is a fire department review. And so they have to have a certain number of connections for how many units would be proposed. And so um, they would have to show that they can provide um, safe um, connections to all units that are proposed and meet the various standards of the agencies, including if they're disrupting any um, uh, buffer, stormwater buffer areas, it would have to be reviewed by stormwater as well. Any other questions? Commissioner Sims? Um, I did go Sunday and try to see the property. It's very difficult to get to it, so it's hard. I could drive around it, but that was it. My concern is if we allow something like this with it does have some serious, I mean, and I think it's good, conservation problems. I mean, I don't want us to damage all of our conservation places. And um, does this set any kind of precedent for us in terms of, it doesn't matter what's there, so just. Well, I will say that there are um, there are protections that are built into the building permit review in regards to stormwater areas, floodplain, um, stormwater buffer areas, and so there are um, other regulatory protections that take place during um, the building permit review. And so it wouldn't be that it's rezoned and all of a sudden you can do whatever you want to in the creek or in any of the buffers. Um, those are all reviewed and heavily regulated by. Um, stormwater regulations that are in place. Any other questions? We'll need a motion from somebody. Preferably not the council member, <laughs> since it's his project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can get a motion from somebody. I mean, just obviously you're you're a member of the commission, but, but <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure we're okay. I, I think um, I think after everything, I've been convinced, I guess. So I'm going to do a soft approval. No. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make a motion that we do uh, approve um, uh, the zone change to, you know, item number 11 um, against uh, staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? And a second. Any other discussion? All in favor of approving not the staff recommendation, but approving the project, say aye. 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 Oppose. Oppose one, two, three, four. Ayes. One, two, three, four, five. Five to four. And so the, the motion is adopted, which 
goes against staff recommendation to approve the actual project. Rezone. All right. So. Uh, how about, can we, commissioners, we've been here for, we've been here for two hours, but I think we could get one more in maybe. Is that okay? And then take a break after that. Okay. So we're on item 12. Item 12, here we go. Okay, item 12. Uh, the request is to rezone from R6 one and two family residential to RM15 multifamily residential. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. The site is located in North Nashville on the east side of Delta Street bounded by Coffee Street to the north and I-65 to the south. As previously mentioned, the site is currently zoned R6 and is surrounded primarily by R6 as well. Um, the area has been primarily established under the R6 zoning, um, so with detached single family structures. The site is located within the T4 neighborhood maintenance policy. Um, the intent of this policy is to maintain the existing residential development pattern in the area. And the policy states that when looking at higher intensity uses, they should be located strategically near centers and corridors. This property is located along the eastern edge of a primarily residential area with no relationship to existing centers or corridors. Um, the proposed rezoning is not consistent with the policy when considering the site location and the character of the surrounding properties. Um, therefore, staff recommends disapproval. Not to embarrass you, Amelia, but that was your first time. Job well done. <laughs> yeah. Good job. All right, we'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? The applicant. Oh, Mr. Dale. Come on up. You have 10 minutes and you can oh, say this will take maybe 15 seconds. Uh, now, this is Mr. Kendall's bill. I think he wants to handle this on the council level. And so he, rec he respects your recommendation, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, we'll declare the public hearing closed. And how about Mr. Tibbs, Commissioner Tibbs, you want to go first? That was... Um Perplexing. <laughs> you got me on that one, Roy. Um, <laughs> it could be a motion to disprove. I don't yeah. know. We, no, go ahead. It, it seems like um, it's headed that way. If, um, if Unless well, people want to talk about it. Let's try this. How about... Uh, I'll make a motion and then... Um, well, let's see if there's okay. any discussion other than disapproval or any questions. And then if not, no, seeing that... Okay, yeah. Commissioner Tibbs, why don't you make a motion? <laughs> I make a motion that we uh, disapprove item 12 per staff recommendation. That's a proper motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Items disapproved. Uh, we, let's see. We can do one more. <laughs> <laughs> item 13. And good job, Amelia. Good job. <laughs>
Um, item number 13 is a request to rezone from single family residential RS5 to one and two family residential <laughs> R6A zoning for property located at 329 Gatewood Avenue located on 0.36 acres. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. The site is located again on 0.36 acres, located at 329 Gatewood, approximately 350 feet west of Lishy Avenue. Uh, the property uh, contains one existing single family dwelling. The site is, uh, is within a larger area of RS5 zoning, which is intended for single family dwellings. Uh, the neighborhood consists of a mixture of one and two family residential uses with an established street network. Uh, for reference, Dickerson Pike is to the west and Ellington Parkway is off the page uh, to the east. The site is located within the T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance Policy Area and is also located within the Highland Heights Study Supplemental Policy. Uh, as a general remind, reminder, this supplemental policy was adopted by the Planning Commission last summer um, after an extensive community engagement process which resulted in updates to the community character policy categories um, and it also established um, supplemental policies for this area. The overall community character policy category of T4 neighborhood maintenance did not change um, with the adoption of the supplemental policy, but the study um, did establish the build building regulating plan and the mobility supplemental policy uh, for this area. This site is located within the R1 subdistrict uh, of the building regulating plan in this tan color, which is intended to maintain low to moderate density uh, predominantly single family residential development patterns um, with appropriate building form um, and types, uh, setbacks and building rhythm along the street. So the R1 build, supplemental, um, sorry, R1 development pattern is meant to mirror um, the development pattern often found in T4 urban neighborhood maintenance policies. The building regulating plan explains that the R1 subdistrict supports only the house with one unit and detached accessory dwelling unit DADU building types. This is the building regulating plan on the screen and it goes from R1 and increases in intensity and then um, towards the bottom gets down to mixed use um, subdistricts and, and R1 is at the top and you can see that it's, it's clear in that a house a one unit and a DADU unit um, are the only building types supporting um, by R1. Rezoning to R6A would allow for a two-family housing type, which is inconsistent with the character um, and the housing form identified in the R1 subdistrict of the building regulating plan. While R6A would allow for a DADU, it would also allow for a duplex, and a duplex is inconsistent with the R6A um, zoning, sorry, which is inconsistent with the Highland Heights study area. The only zoning supported by the policies in this location other than than the existing RS5 zoning would be a specific plan that permits a single family residence and a DADU. Absent that type of specific plan, the existing RS5 zoning would be the most appropriate zoning district for this site. Um, as this request is inconsistent with the supplemental policy, staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Thank you, we'll open this item for public hearing and is the applicant in the room, come on up. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jason Feller. I reside at 2628 Houston Lane, Whites Creek, 37189. I have a presentation that is coming up. Um, I've owned this property for 11 years um, and uh, with my wife and our tenant of 11 years has just moved out and we've kind of put in a spot where we need to figure out what to do next. I realize that I have an uphill battle. I have the seemingly impossible task of convincing you that what I want to do um, should be allowed under the Highland Heights neighborhood policy. I do not take that lightly. Um, I've got a lot of information. I'm just going to kind of speed through it. Um, buckle your seat belts and get, get that finger ready to move those slides. Uh, I want to start with, um, I, I engaged in a, a lengthy Facebook discussion. I sent you guys the link. I hope you had the chance to, to read it. There's a, there's a lot of information in there that I can't get to tonight. Um, I'm a home designer by trade, so I, I work with a lot of developers. I wouldn't consider myself one. Um, but I, I know this wheelhouse. Um, 
Uh, I want to start with a couple excerpts from the Nashville Next East Nashville Community Plan. Uh, skipping down to creating housing choice ensures the East Nashville has housing for the diversity of workers needed in the community and Davidson County. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, the next excerpt is from the Nashville Community Character Manual regarding T4 urban neighborhoods. T4 urban neighborhoods are composed of interspersed residential building types to provide housing choice. Detached single family residential units and plex houses may exist as the predominant housing types, but townhouse are also common and may be found on the same block face uh, as single family detached homes. Next slide, please. 329 Gatewood, which is uh, the property in question. Um, I, I'm pushing for R6A. This is intentional. The A is intentional. If you don't know what A stands for, I'm sure you do. Uh, it was designed to promote alternative modes of transportation. Uh, this lot close to Lishy is easily walkable to the neighborhood centers that are currently being built um, and to the red line bus stops along with the many other bus stops along Lishy. Um, R6A forces rear load parking when alleys are present, uh, which is the case on this lot. Uh, which severely limits parking options uh, on the residences. Uh, and this is a big deal for some of the Gatewood neighbors um, because Gatewood is a relatively small street and this would help keep cars off of Gatewood. Um, R6A also requires 18 to 36 inches of exposed foundation. Um, with the existing terrain and the height width requirements on detached duplex, this will essentially force these duplexes to be attached. So no small, sk uh, tall skinnies. I can explain that a little bit more, but uh, suffice to say on a 50 foot lot, if you're doing uh, detached duplexes, they have to be 17 foot wide, which means they can only be 25 and a half feet tall. It's impossible almost to get a good looking house in that height. Uh, when you're talking about adding 18 to 36 inches of foundation, which would be the case here even more uh, because of the slope on the lot, it's, it's nearly impossible. So my goal was to force these to be together to uh, mimic uh, single family homes and fit with the uh, other uh, new construction houses on the street. Next slide, please. Um, the other notable characteristics for this project, these duplexes will have a smaller footprint than the largest historic home on the street um, because I know stormwater is an issue. The house at 325 Gatewood is a 1920s house, has roughly 1,880 square foot footprint. Uh, add on the porches and decks, it hits around 2,100 square feet. Uh, the, the proposed plan you see here is um, uh, the whole building is, has a, has a uh, footprint of around 1,800 square feet, so it's smaller than the largest historic house on the, on the, on the street. Um, this block of Gatewood is currently 20% multifamily, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, and then like the East Nashville Next Community Plan and the character policy say, uh, that uh, having an interspersed mix of housing types uh, often occur on the same block. Next slide, please. Affordability, big hot button topic uh, in National Next East Com Nashville Community Plan states, providing housing that is attainable for residents of all incomes keeps the community and its economy resilient and keeps East Nashville competitive in the region in the face of changing demographics and market preferences. You have two great examples here. One is 315 Gatewood, just up the street, about four lots, and then you have uh, 1407 Stainback, which is just to the south of where my lot is. These houses are within 800 feet of each other. One of them is a single family home with three bedrooms, uh, and it sold for uh, $450,000 in February of this year. The other one is an attached duplex, which is what I'm wanting to do, uh, with three bedrooms and a sales price of $335,000 that sold a month later. Um, holds the same amount of people, holds the same amount of residences, <coughs> or residents, and is $115,000 less. That's a 25% increase in price. Uh, if you're talking about affordability, an attached duplex does that um, in a place that I think can support it. Uh, $115,000 is knocks out a lot of your buyer pool, and uh, and that's not that's not consistent with what the Nashville Next Plan calls for. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, obviously, the big elephant in the room is the Highland Heights uh, study. Here's the building regulating plan. Um, Here's my portion of the neighborhood. Uh, there are about five portions that are zoned R1. If you'll go to the next slide, please, I want to focus in on mine. Uh, this portion, the Gatewood portion, here's the lot. It's the only portion, the only R1 subdistrict in this plan that has alleys. This is extremely important because this is where the A designation for the zoning comes into play. It forces rear parking, which is huge for this neighborhood. The other thing that only this section has is two north-south connectors on Meridian and Lishy that connect you to Douglas and Trinity. Um, 
that's vitally important. It gives you easy access to uh, the main thoroughfares. Um, next slide, please. Want to talk about uh, the existing use. Uh, next slide, please. The existing use. Uh, in this neighborhood, you'll see uh, this is the entire neighborhood, residential single family, 59.4%. Residential two to four family, 6.1% and 0.9%. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> if you look at my block of Gatewood, uh, these are all street facing duplexes. This is kind of half. This has half of a, one is facing Meridian, the other is facing Gatewood. This is a quadplex. Sorry, I'm nervous, that's why I'm shaking. Uh, and, and then these are duplexes that face Gatewood. Um, compared to the rest of the neighborhood, this block of Gatewood has, is, is currently 21% multifamily. So to say that duplexes would not be acceptable or in context with what's happening on this block, it just doesn't fly to me. And on top of that, you have the hundreds of lots that are just south of that on Pinnock, Meridian, Stainback, and Lishy that all have 25 foot wide lot lines, um, which is, represents the density that I'm trying to put on my lot on Gatewood. Next slide, please. Parking's a huge deal, whether it's RS5 or R6A, um, I need to do RS5 with a DADU, I need to plan for eight vehicular units. Because of what R6A does and the way zoning sees an HPR, I can actually put four, uh, uh, I can put all eight vehicular units in the alley secured. I can't do that on RS5. Uh, they cannot be secured back there uh, because of the way zoning views uh, uh, garages and um, DADUs. Um, next slide, please. Bus stops galore. There's, there's the lot, all the bus stops along Lishy. Two red line bus stops right here and right here are within an eight minute walk of each other. Uh, this falls in line with the Nashville community character. Next slide, please. So not a next slide, it's next slide. Uh, already 21% multifamily, has alleys, which R6A forces the rear load parking, flanked by two north-south connectors, easy access to bus routes, proposed duplexes have a smaller footprint than the largest house on the block, which is historic. Um, R6A would force these duplexes to be attached, no tall skinnies, and the attached duplexes provide a more affordable housing option to homeowners looking for a house with a yard where single-family homeless might reach. I'd like to save the rest of my time, please. Minute and 40 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Welcome. Real quick, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 1806 Allison Place. Um, I, I can't imagine adding anything that he hasn't already covered. Uh, but as somebody who's worked uh, in the in the process for Highland for the Highland Heights Community Plan and has worked with the results of the Highland Heights Community Plan, uh, I think you guys have heard from us. You've heard from most of us involved on either side. Uh, we've argued. We've agreed that the per the plan is not 100% full foolproof. Um, it's not perfect, and I think Gatewood might be that one example where. There, it's questionable. While we result, while we uh, we landed on that R1 district, I think there was a lot of debate about this. In the end, the planning commission said, eh, "We're not going to make any modifications from this point on. We're just going to let it work." But I really believe that Gatewood might be that one exception. There is a variety of housing in, on this block. There's quadplexes, duplexes. There are 25-foot lots immediately south of him uh, to hold him to a single-family standard. Just seen and all that, and so. Uh we probably need to go ahead and take our break, and then um, we'll get right back uh, to where we are, which is uh, right where, and then we'll, we'll give uh, the speaker his a full two minutes, just to be fair, uh, <laughs> since he was um, interrupted. And so we'll go ahead and take a break, and then we'll, we'll go right back into session, uh, into our session uh, for folks that are speaking in favor. Break usually lasts 10, 15 minutes, about 10 minutes. Commissioners, I do want to apologize. Your monitors in front of you are not working, but we have the monitor on your side. So uh, you'll, you'll have to look at the monitor above us and... <laughs> but we are uh, we are in what the position of where we are after the break. So we're on item 13. Uh, the public hearing is open, and 
we are having the folks that want to speak in support. And so, Dwayne, we'll let you speak again. So come on up. Welcome. Um, yeah, I don't want to reiterate. I just kind of want to reiterate what I was what I was talking about. Not, a lot of us worked on this plan. Uh, for the most part, you know, we all think it's a great plan. There are a few pockets where it's debatable, and we feel like this particular street is is one of those exceptions where you can debate it. Uh, if you look at the context, there are duplexes, quadplexes. Again, there are 25 foot lots across the street. Uh, from this property. It's got the infrastructure. Um, at the end of the day, we, we resolved to, to, to lump it in with the R1, but again, even after this body adopted that plan, there was still a lot of debate as to whether that was the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that Mr. Feller's uh, request to you is um, found found in context, uh, are compatible with the context. Uh, I'm hopeful that the designs that he showed you represent some form of com compromise with the character uh, of the neighborhood. Just what was on the screen seems like it, it it's, it's mindful of uh, the scale and the rhythm that would be set up otherwise in, in this sub-district. Uh, so as uh, somebody who represents a, a lot of uh, property owners in the uh, area, I just wanted to step up and, and and I'll just tell you I support it. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing no one else, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. I don't know if you want to take them. Good evening once again. I am speaking in opposition this time. Um, my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. I reside at 1826 Story Circle, and I am a neighbor just a couple of blocks away from this. Um, I do respect staff's um, research into this, and with all due respect, Mr. Feller has a very compelling argument, but the fact is simple. This particular rezoning does not fit the neighborhood plan. If you look at this street, the majority, if not all of the lots on this street are zoned RS5. The duplexes, the quadplexes that currently exist are non-conforming. So as well as, as you know so well, if something were to be done with those properties, they would have to conform to the current zoning. Um, we have, Mr. Feller and I had a very long discussion on the phone. I suggested several alternatives for him, and in the end, his decision was to go and push for R6A. So I respectfully request that you honor the staff's recommendation, disapprove um, this particular rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Come on up. And then state your name and address. Thank you. Hello again. Thank you for your service. My name is Ray Sovereign. I live at 1602 Lishy Avenue, which is just around the corner from this property. I know people um, in that neighborhood. I'm very connected in that neighborhood. And I know um, that the... Um, the desire of the, the property owner is to increase value for that, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. One would be there's a nice house there, fix it up, sell it at market, you got a profit. Um, but this particular part of, of Gatewood is had a lot of traumatic changes in it. Um, there's been parts that um, have been completely built off of um, old zoning or uh, approval for housing types that uh, was done before our plan. I participated in the Tourette that was done. I respect incredibly this department and its staff for what they do. I think that it's the one place that things are transparent in this city where, where a citizen can come forward and have a discussion and actually find out there's a department that gives us the facts and gives us advice as to what to do. Um, we went through that Tourette not all of us agreed with everything. There were a lot of things that we didn't agree with. There will be exceptions, um, but this property shouldn't be one of them because it's not included in those buffer zones that go around um, that are for the corridor streets. So I'm asking um, that we respect the staff's recommendation to disapprove this and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, rebuttal, two minutes. Uh, minute and 40 seconds. Actually, I respectfully ask for an additional minute because uh, to refresh some of the stuff that I've. Uh, uh, well, that that would be in opposition to our rules that we have. Okay. Um, so, a minute and forty seconds. Can I get the last slide, please? And can I get the time um, restarted? The last slide, please. Thank <laughs> you. 
keep going, keep going, last slide. Yeah, there you go. Uh, thank you again. I, uh, building regulating plan timeline. Uh, I was part of the SHREP process. Uh, wanted to go through this uh, for the purpose of showing the different sub-districts. Uh, you have your four sub-districts that seem to stay the, the same throughout the charrette process and throughout the planning study process. Here on March 8th, which is the week of the charrette, um, at the end of the week, planning staff presented this. You'll notice that my part of the neighborhood was in the R2 sub-district category. At this time, this included duplexes and quadplexes where appropriate. If you look at the May 1st preliminary draft that was sent out, uh, you'll notice that these four sections, R1, stayed the same as they were here. They stayed the same throughout, and my section was bumped to an R3. Uh, R3 at the time was the same as R2 over here, which is duplexes, single family with that used, and quadplexes were appropriate. On the final draft presented to the public on May 14th that was ultimately adopted, again, all four of these stayed the same. This section changed. The point in that, I understand it's a process, decisions have to be made. The point I'm trying to make here is that this section of the neighborhood was not a slam dunk. And I don't think it was a slam dunk for the reasons that I've already outlined in which uh, Mr. Cuthbertson has alluded to. This, this is the only R1 sub-district that has uh, alleys, which takes advantage of the R6A zoning. It has the north-south connectors that get you easily to uh, Douglas and, and, uh, and Trinity. Um, it, it, it's a traditional urban grid pattern with alleys that would support this, these duplexes. And so I would ask that you would please uh, support my request for the zone change from RS5 to R6A. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Blackshear, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, that was a really impressive presentation. I'm not sure we've ever seen an applicant give such a great presentation, so thank you for that. It was very helpful for us. Um, it, it seems like your argument is that the Highland Heights supplemental policy be changed um, because it's clearly your um, your um, proposal with the zone change would clearly be in um, violation of what the policy currently states. So it sounds like you're arguing that the policy should be changed. And I, I think we had a recent item that you guys were here for maybe <laughs> where um, some neighbors had argued that the Highland Heights supplemental policy be changed and we decided that we were not going to change the policy because a lot of work had been um, expended in getting the policy to where it is now and we think there needs to be some period of just letting it be and letting it live. Um, and so I, I guess I, um, I think you had great arguments, but it, it, it doesn't seem to um, fix the problem, which is that it's the proposed zone change would be in contravention of the policy and we're not, we don't have a policy change before us, but I don't think we would um, change the Highland Heights supplemental policy even if we did. So I, my, um, my reaction would be to approve staff's recommendation of disapproval. Commissioner Allen. I would concur. I, I think this sets a bad precedent. I, I, I appreciated the, the comments that were made by the applicant. I think he did a really nice job and made some compelling points, but I'm inclined to support staff. Councilman. Well, we just recently told uh, the local people that uh, we wouldn't reopen the, the review of this plan. And so I just, I think we already made a decision that we're not going to do it. So I think that's it for me. Commissioner Moore. I agree, but I do want to, to the applicant, that was a really great presentation. So, um, but again, as stated, I think we've kind of made our decision, so. Commissioner Gallo. I, I agree too. Commissioner Sims. No comment, I agree. Vice Chair. Um, you know, I think I think you're right about every the fellow my fellow commissioners are right about the precedent. Um, I will say I just browsed through the Facebook discussion, and I'm very impressed that this applicant really did go out into the community and engage with the conversation. I think if we did approve this, then most likely we would see a very respectfully done set of duplexes that would fit very nicely in with that neighborhood. But we're doing a rezoning and. Even though we want to support this individual, we're setting a precedent for redeveloping that street. So I have to support the staff's recommendation. Commissioner Tibbs. I make a motion of um, disapproval based on item number 13 based on staff recommendation. What's the proper motion? Is there a second? 
There's a second. Any other discussion? All in favor of staff's recommendation for disapproval, say aye. Aye. Because no, ayes have it, and it's disapproved. We are on item 18. Um, so there were some items that were on the consent agenda, uh, and so Lisa's going to bring us up. Some of them got pulled off, but I believe that there's been some changes or some compromises that have been made on those particular things in the neighborhood. Sure. Um, first, we had item number 30 that had been um, originally not on consent, um, and we wanted to check to see if anyone was here to speak um, in opposition to item number 30, which is a subdivision on Payne Road. Uh, I didn't have anyone sign up for that. Um, we believed that there was some opposition in advance of the printing, um, but we did not have anyone here. Um, and staff recommendation is to approve with conditions as it is inconsistent and meets the subdivision regulations if you wanted to place that one on consent. Yeah, so let's ask the audience, is anyone here on item 30? Anyone here in support on item 30? Anyone here in opposition? So the, the chair can, can entertain a motion to put it on, place it on consent? We, we, we're going to, I think there's a couple others. Yeah, we'd probably need to just to make sure that we get a clear record. Use your mic. Commissioner, if you use your mic, that'd be good. Turn your mic. It's okay. Um, I make a motion that we uh, um, put item number 30 uh, back on consent agenda. So this is on the consent agenda, it was never on. Mm -hmm. It was never on the consent agenda. Item 30. It was the council person that wanted to speak on it, and so the council person is not here. That's the explanation. So it would just be a motion to put it on consent. Okay. Not oh, back did on. Did I say put it back on? Yeah. <laughs> I want just. I want I to think, be transparent. Yeah, I did say that. I'm sorry. I meant to say. Right. Um, I make a motion that we put item number 30 on consent. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? A second. Any other discussion? I want to make sure everybody's clear. All right. Seeing no other discussion, all in favor of item 30 going on consent agenda and being passed, say aye. 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 No. Uh, anyone in opposition? Ayes have it. All right. Is there another one? Yes. Okay. Um, item number 31 had originally been on the consent agenda. There was, um, it was pulled from consent. Um, my understanding is that the um, people that had concerns have been in discussions with the developer um, while we've been working our way through the meeting and they have come to an agreement and that it can go back onto consent. All right, so let's be clear. Is, is there anyone in the audience in opposition? I'll make sure. Opposing it to go back on consent. All right. So seeing none, uh, commissioners will entertain a motion to put this item back on consent. There's been a motion, a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of putting item 31 back on the consent agenda, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Item 31 is back on the consent. Do we have one more, or is that it? That's it. And we'll, we'll go through some of these and make sure... It, uh, just because there's been like 16 items that we're hearing tonight, so. All right, so we are on item 18. Next item is a request to rezone from CS to SP for a retail and self storage space at 4119 Murfreesboro Pike. 
staff recommendation is to approve with all conditions and disapprove without all conditions. <coughs> this site is located on the south side of Murfreesboro Pike. Uh, it's in the Antioch area. It's bordered by an industrial zoning to the south and the west and PUD and agricultural to the north and to the east. The policy is T3 suburban mixed use corridor. This policy intends to encourage a greater mix of densities and uses along the corridor. The proposed project is a 91,800 square foot multi-use building. Uh, 3,544 square feet of that is to be retail space. 88,277 square foot is to be self-storage space. The retail space will go in the front along Murfreesboro Pike. The proposed development is situated between two large industrial uses. Given the location of the site, having the retail space located up to the front, it creates a built environment that is consistent with the suburban mixed use character of this policy area. It complies with all standards of the Murfreesboro Pike urban design overlay. Therefore, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up. So you have 10 minutes and you can save two minutes for rebuttal of the 10. All right. Um, the last guy was. Please a, state uh, your name and address. Oh, yes, uh, Jonathan Lanning. Um, I live at 513 Moore Avenue um, in the Wedgwood Houston neighborhood. I am the owner and developer for uh, 4119 Murfreesboro Pike, the Freedom Storage Project. Uh, Freedom Storage will be a veteran owned small business. Um, we've been working with Councilmember Lee um, since we realized we were needing to do the SP zoning. I met with Councilmember Lee. Um, we held a community meeting in March uh, at the uh, in the uh, sorry uh, Cane Ridge community meeting. Uh, during the community meeting, we had 100% uh, approval, no no objections. Uh, we, from there, uh, we worked with uh, Yorn, Sean, and Justin at planning to make sure that everything uh, met the UDO standards and was consistent with the uh, Murfreesboro Pike corridor. Um, we, we met everything and uh, they've given us approval. So it was on consent and it got pulled off. So here I am and really, that's all I got. Okay, well, good deal. We'll save uh, two minutes for your rebuttal. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Good evening, Twanachuk, 5967 Cane Ridge Road. Um, we didn't meet with Cane Ridge on this, so it may be a different group up and down Murfreesboro Road. Um, we had some history about this area as a result of all the investigation for Mill Ridge Park when that was being discussed, which is just upstream from this. And most of my concerns uh, arise from having had a, a side view of all that going on. Immediately behind this property is the creek, I believe it's Hurricane Creek. And living currently today in that creek are mink, otter, beaver, things you don't get to see a lot of places. Uh, so the first thing I would ask is that there be a larger buffer along the backside to protect this creek. It feeds right into the uh, other thing that runs into Percy Priest Lake. Also, uh, incidentally, because we were looking at the history as it related to Mill Ridge Park, we found out about this being part of the Trail of Tears and one of the uh, areas where camps existed for the Civil War. Um, and the railway is just behind it and there were some significant skirmishes along that. So I would ask that it be investigated, looked at perhaps by the Metro Historical Commission, someone to make sure, because I'm, I'm sure this will be completely raised down to bedrock. So if it can be looked at from a historical perspective and make sure there aren't artifacts and things there that need to be removed and preserved. Uh, the Mill Ridge Park Museum would be a great place for items like that if anything is discovered. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. It's John Stern, 1437 Winding Creek Drive. Um, 
Just to, let me reiterate one point. Uh, there was no meeting held in Cane Ridge about this. Uh, she's in charge of the Cane Ridge Community Club, so we, we would know. Um, and really, that's a part of a bigger problem we're experiencing out in this district. Um, we're not able to get engagement with um, our current elected official out there, and I'm sorry I have to say that, but talking with developers and planning people, and they just keep reiterating it's hard to uh, get anything back and forth from her. Uh, so. I'm extremely concerned about the level of informed community engagement regarding uh, the planned, uh, the uh, SP overlay. And because people can't be expected to advocate for what they really want unless they're told what are the things they can possibly get. You know, when I think about self-storage, I see a uh, storage facility on Andrew Jackson Parkway that's buffered beautifully uh, along all the roadways. You can't tell it's there. You can't see the RVs or the boats. So there's good examples and bad examples. And we would just like to make sure that this is a good example when it's done and told. I think the people of Antioch deserve as good a thing as the people of Bellevue or Hillsborough West End or Hermitage. So we just ask your help in doing that, possibly deferring this for a meeting or so to at least get us engaged in it to see what uh, can be done to make it better. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute. Yeah, um, Miss Councilmember Lee, when I met with her um, and her assistant, uh, her secretary, we met, we discussed the project. She sent out flyers to, I'm not sure who she sent, but we had a meeting at Cane Ridge Elementary. There was 10 or, or 10 or 12 people there that showed up. Uh, I presented the project. I, I, I had a rendering. I actually, I have a rendering if you'd like to see what it looks like. Uh, sir, if you address oh, 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 sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Okay. sorry. Yeah, I have a rendering of the project if they would like to see what it looks like. It's a beautiful building. It's a Class A facility. It's not, it's not what you think of a metal garage doors. This is a three-story beautiful building um, along Murfreesboro Pike, and. Um, uh, you know, after meeting with, with planning, you know, that they think it's a good project and, and, and we do too. Um, I, and as far as the Civil War stuff, we my family's on this for 30 years. We've never, that's a, this is the first we've heard of any Civil War stuff. And, and actually a guy at the community meeting, he, um, he asked me if he would have permission to go out there and metal detect for Civil War relics and I gave him all, permission. I said, you can go out there and dig and do whatever you want. So <laughs> whether he went out there and did that or not, I don't know. But I gave him permission. And actually, the guy at the community meeting, um, he was an advocate for um, the, the creeks. And uh, he, he said he was going to go out there and check to make sure there was no creeks or anything, um, any old trees or creeks on the property. And then if there was, that he would call me and we would address the situation. And uh, I never heard from There is no creeks on the property. I mean, I've, 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 we've owned it for 30 years. So um, that, that's all I've got. Thank you. And seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Alam, you want to go first? Um, this is interesting when we're hearing that um, the council member is not as responsive as, as the, maybe the community would like, um, which I guess is an important, well, it is an important part of this process. Um, anyway, so I'm going to move on. I would like to hear others comment on that, but uh, it, it, for staff, I'm curious 
as part of the SP process, what was considered um, with the environmental, environmentally sensitive areas at the rear? How, how did that come into play? Sure, I did want to make one note. Um, in your staff report, it says that it's not applicable for stormwater, and that it actually was an approval from stormwater, and I have had that verified. It, they approved it as a preliminary, and so stormwater has looked at it to determine if there were any buffers, um, and it would have had to stay out of the buffer. If there were buffers, it would stay out of those buffer areas. Um, so that is part of the review. Um, I would also say that um, because this is in a UDO, um, and it w is within an urban design overlay that has um, some, some more strict standards in regards to design and landscaping and those sorts of things, that our UDO team has also been um, involved in review of this and making sure it's meeting all those standards that have been adopted through uh, work with the community. Thank you. Councilman. I'm uh, curious about the historic artifacts that they were talking about. Are, are, do we have, maybe that's a question for you, like what type of, uh, uh, do we require like on Fort Negley, for example, to go through on some kind of an extensive uh, research on a site to decide if there are uh, historic artifacts and, and if they find them, are they required to report them? And if they report them, are they required to do something about it? So typically when we get a, a packet of new cases, um, those are distributed to various review agencies, including um, our historic um, commission staff. Um, and the historic commission staff have various resources at their hands, wherein outside of just things that are within a designated district, um, they have various uh, resources to know whether there may be cemeteries or other uh, historical sites around the county and they will at times even when something is not within a designated district comment on a project and I don't believe we received any comments from them on this one um, and so it's not part of a standard review that we would say to every applicant that there has to be a complete historical review. So we will have to put a condition that they uh, check the site. Is that yes? If we're yes, I think I think if there was an investigation, you could you could requ you could request that the historic staff do a review prior to final site plan or something along those lines. I would just want to give it a point in time that you would want the report back, and um, and then we would evaluate that as part of our review of the final. Thanks. Anything, anything else, Councilman? No, I mean, I was just curious about that because uh, in Cambridge we have a lot of, uh, I mean, I, w I went for a walk with uh, Tuana through the woods. That sounds kind of weird. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she went to show me all these sites that we have in Cambridge. It's, it's full of places that are not necessarily recorded. So they have been working on, on creating a, a uh, map with all the um, historic sites and, and artifacts and issues that are there because that's our history, right? We want to preserve uh, what make Cambridge be Cambridge. And so uh, I just think it's an important consideration if there is any uh, reporting or, or comments about uh, potentially being historic artifacts, we wouldn't then be swept by a bulldozer going through the site. So I just wanted to and do you some due diligence. Commissioner Moore. Um, uh, follow up to it, you mentioned the stormwater approval, um, but it was mentioned that there's a lot of wildlife back in the creek, so can you speak to maybe that piece of it? So I did want to say uh, I have Sean kind of looking some stuff up for me on the computer and reporting back, and um, there aren't any streams or wetlands or buffers at all on this site. Um, there is an industrial site kind of behind this where there is some, but it's over 100 feet away as mapped from this site. So there aren't any of those um, on this site. And I guess my only other comment, it does seem like a key piece is missing with the community engagement. So um, I guess I'll continue to listen to everybody else, but. Commissioner Gettle. I tend to get, agree with Council Member Bedney. I think if we get some kind of provision that they do a little bit of due diligence on the historic components. Uh, but I'm inclined to support the staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims. 
Do we have anything from the council person at all about whether they support it or not? Any? I, I don't believe that we've received any written communications. Um, I know that some of our staff have had um, conversations with her um, in regards to the project um, and um, it's um, how it relates to the urban design overlay, mm -hmm. which is adopted with mm -hmm. the um, more stringent standards, mm -hmm. um, but we don't have anything in writ okay. written. Oh, thank you. Okay. And in our conditions, are all the requirements of the UDO actually captured here, or is that just... Okay. Yeah, you'll see number two, okay. which is that the final site plan is reviewed yes. for compliance. But I will say that they have already submitted and started working through the UDO, and it does meet the standards of the okay. UDO per our staff reviewers. Okay. No more questions. Thank you. Vice Chair. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, before I make a motion, I, I do like the fact that there some of these um, storages um, I do feel are not always in the most ideal place, and I do feel like because of the base, uh, the industrial around it, that it is, and um, the fact that it's mixed use too in there, which is something that's a little different. That I, I so I, I definitely. Um, feel better about it because of that. Also, um, but I do have the concerns about the historic site. Uh, I do know that Historical Commission has a, uh, they've done a lot of work on researching where the Trail of Tears is, and that's part of the, their ongoing effort. So, um, so I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve Along with staff recommendations, I'd like to add that the uh, Metro Historic Zoning Commission, before final site plan approval, uh, do a uh, survey of their own uh, reference as well as whatever is necessary to uh, make sure it's not any type of uh, historical uh, significance that needs to be uh, researched before approval. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Any other discussion? Seeing no other discussion, all in favor of the staff's recommendation, including the extra condition, all say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And it's adopted. Item, so we are on item 24. Uh, but before we consider item 24, hold on. Thank you. Item 24 was placed on the consent agenda. Is there anyone in the room that's in opposition to item 24? He's leaving the room, so I think he's out there, though. Yeah, I think that item was... Yeah, why, why don't you see if he's still opposed to item 24? He's, he's waited this long, so... <laughs> we want to be fair. Oh, no, not, not you, not you. Wrong person. John Stern. You're good. Good night. No, not you. Sorry. No, not you. You're good. We're sorry. So, Mr. Stern, you... Uh, Mr. Stern. John. Somebody stop John. All right, so, oh, he's on his way. All right, so I think uh, is, we'll ask the question again. Is anyone in the room on item 24 in opposition? Okay. Okay, so we do have, so let's go ahead and do the presentation. And so the way it will, will go, sir, is that we'll do the presentation and then the developer will, um, the applicant will have 10 minutes and then we'll um, recognize folks that are for the project, and then if you're in opposition to the project, you'll be the next after that, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry. Yeah, no, this, that's, that's what we're here for. All right. <laughs> Item 24. 
Okay, item 24 is a request to rezone from AR2A to a specific plan mixed residential zoning for property located at Tusculum Road at the southeast corner of Benzing Road and Tusculum Road to prevent 196 multifamily residential units on 27 acres. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The vacant site is comprised of 27 acres and is located near the southeast corner of Tusculum Road and Benzing Road. The property is heavily wooded and is located south of the Whitmore Branch, which runs north of Tusculum and Benzing Roads. The predominant land use pattern north of the site includes traditional suburban development, while the development pattern south of Tusculum and Benzing Roads includes a mixture of single family, multifamily, and vacant properties. The site is adjacent to multifamily development located between the site and Bell Road to the south. Um, the site is zoned AR2A and is surrounded by properties zoned for single family, multifamily, and non residential uses. The plan proposes 196 multifamily residential units, comprised of 66 stacked flats units um, located up here. Uh, the, uh, sorry, um, 72 townhome units and 58 detached cottage units. The stacked flats units are located in two buildings up here on uh, south of Tusculum Road. The townhome units are located southwest to the southwest kind of mid-site, and then the cottage units are located towards the southern property line um, uh, at the southeastern portion of the site. Access into the site is provided um, in two areas uh, from a private driveway network, but it connects to the public road uh, at Tusculum and at Benzing Road. Um, the first access point is off of Tusculum, east of the intersection, and then the second access point is to the southwest. The Benzing Road access point will be gated for emergency access only. The site is parked through a combination of surface parking spots um, and individual garages. Tusculum Road will be improved per the MCSP requirements of a six foot sidewalk and eight foot planning strip. And um, Benzing Road will be improved per the local uh, sidewalk requirements of five feet and four feet. Um, there's a parcel in between the site here um, and the, the plans show s sidewalk improvements will extend along the front of this parcel, parcel 055, in order to connect the new sidewalk network. Open space is included throughout the site, including stormwater management areas and large areas where the existing vegetation is intended to be preserved, uh, particularly here off of Benzing Road. The plan includes architectural standards as included in your staff reports and limits the overall maximum building height to three stories and 45 feet. Staff finds a plan to be consistent with the land use policies at this location. Uh, the plan includes a mixture of housing types consistent with T3 neighborhood um, evolving guidance to provide more housing choice. And the development footprint is located away from the conservation policy areas, which at this site identify potential steep slopes. Uh, therefore, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you, we'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Roy Dale with Dale & Associates. Uh, this project is a really good example on how communities can work together. Um, I hear a lot about affordability. Uh, council members can't make that happen. I can't make that happen. You can't make that happen. It's a collective. We have to work together as a community. And so what I, this, we, we actually started working on this in the early fall. We had a community meeting. I presented a plan with nothing on the plan. Absolutely blank piece of paper. And I asked the community, what do you want? Um, it's, it's, it's really a great community that Councilman Bedney is a council member of. So many times, and you've seen that before, I think last week on that Knob Road subdivision, as a matter of fact, you'll, run on pro you'll, you'll actually do plants on properties where you have people that just don't want to see anything at all. But in this case, this community is concerned about affordability. They're concerned about a lot of different things. And so they worked together to come up with a plan that provides basically three levels of housing. Stacked flats for police officers or for school teachers or for Metro employees that maybe cannot afford uh, a house. Uh, townhouses, townhouses with tucked under garages and then detached cottages. So this plan provides a whole level of different types of housing. 
Um, the larger building in the front actually has about 6,000 square feet that's going to be used by residents there. It's an office. They can have a, 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 cal a coffee bar there, and so they can work together on projects. It would be a great place for people to meet. Um, when we met with the community, there had been a shooting on this property. This is a large agricultural piece of property, and I think people come out Benzing Road, which is a very narrow, sort of a secluded area. They dump their mattresses. They go shoot weapons. There's all kinds of things that happen out there that community is concerned about. I think this will help that. Um, the houses on Benzing, which are on the low end of the property, this has a hillside. A lot of the drainage from this property runs across Benzing Road into their yards. It creates problems. So as a part of this proposal, the storm drainage on the upper side will be totally intercepted. All that storm waters will be taken down the opposite side of Benzing Road and directed to Mill Creek. So it's going to solve a large amount of drainage problems as well. And so um, it's really been a pleasure to actually work on this because I've seen a plan come together again that uh, community greatly supports. Uh, there were three uh, ladies here earlier today that had not been able to attend a lot of the meetings. I was able to talk to them. I think they understand this. They all lived on Benzing Road and they all basically left, I think, okay. Uh, there's um, a neighborhood group here, a fairly strong neighborhood group. They had one of the spokespersons from that group here earlier, uh, which Councilman Bendy probably knows, Donald Blunt. He was sent here on, on behalf of Joanne Crow and that group, but he had to leave. They were also in support. And if it's, if it's okay, I'll, I'll get people to raise their hands. They're in support. So there are other people here that are, are in support too. I'm not going to get them to speak. I see no reason to do that. Uh, this has already been well vetted within this community, and I think we're going to have a, a very positive result. As staff had mentioned, you have property on Benzing Road. We have frontage on Tuscan Road. There's a piece of property in between. We need to connect the sidewalks. We're going to go ahead across a piece of property that this client doesn't own and can make a connected sidewalk system. So I think that's good as well. So I think this will be a very positive plan. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this develop. I think the community is going to be very happy with it. And um, I would hope that you would um, recommend approval based upon the staff's comments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we'll have two minutes for rebuttal for you. And then anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Come on up, sir, state your name and address. Uh, so will we do the support first and, oh, then, sorry, I'm, I'm and, and then opposition? Yes, sir. If you're in opposition, we'll get to you after the support. <laughs> sorry. No, you're good. Good evening, staff. staff. Uh, my name is uh, Dre Shafiq. I reside on uh, Ash Grove Drive, just right around the corner from where that uh, property is. And I'm in favor of the project for numerous reasons. I've been in that area and live in that area for quite a while. Some of my family uh, members and distant relatives and close friends also live in that area. And um, I live with my wife and my daughter. Um, the subject of possibly moving out to a bigger place um, has come up numerous times in the past. And we all know lately with the whole house booming and all that stuff, it is kind of hard to find something new uh, for, you know, uh, something affordable unless you kind of move out of move out of the area. And, you know, both my wife and I live, uh, I mean, we're close to that area and we would like to stay in that area for as long as we can and I'm pretty familiar with the area as well. So um, kind of when, when I heard about this coming up, we're both kind of happy about it because if, you know, if not now, maybe quite a few years down the line, um, it is something that, you know, it is within our budget that we can afford. And um, earlier I heard some of the other projects <clears throat> on um, Patterson, Old Hickory, I believe, which were kind of, you know, I was pretty happy about those as well because if this doesn't work out, maybe that one does. So, uh, but um, all in all, I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor for it. And I hope it is something that you guys take into consideration because number one, it'll be something affordable for the area. I'm pretty sure the uh, prices will be within the price ranges that, that are for the current homes in that area. And uh, it won't be nothing too crazy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down. Anyone else? Come on up. Welcome. 
Thank you for <coughs> thank you for the opportunity, uh, Bashir Mahmoud, for uh, four fifteen Tuscaloosa Road, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm in favor of a project like this because me and my wife are both graduate students, and uh, we plan to establish to build our life here in Nashville. And with having so much student loan, we are not able to afford anywhere in Nashville or anywhere near Nashville except for a project like this. So. For a reason like this, or some more reasons, I'm in a favor of a project, and I hope you too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Mr. Chairman, dear commissioners, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm Yasin Kokoi. I am the owner and the, the developer of this project. I'm giving you an example of the necessity of this project to the community. I've been in that area for 22 years with my family. My kids, my three kids went to the elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. They graduate from Middle Tennessee College. So they want to stay in the area. They, they got married. They, when they have their memories in there, they have their friends, their community that they are attached to, and they, they don't want to leave the, that area. They want to stay there. So we cannot make lands anymore. So we need to increase density of the lands that we have in the area, as well as we, by developing this property, you can take care of other concerns that Mr. Roy Dale brought up about the safety of the community that's becoming and raising a great concern of the community, and it made its way to the media lately. So I hope uh, I am fully uh, up to uh, going with all rules and recommendations, and uh, I am trusting our departments, metro departments, as a safeguard through the uh, development and building of this project. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing no one else in support, opposition, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? <coughs> Come on up, sir. And uh, you have two minutes. Please state your name and your yes, address. I have how, how long? Two minutes, and All the right. timer is right there. All right, yes, sir. Um, You'll talk in the microphone. All yeah. right, yes, sir. First of all, um, I'm kind of nervous. Can we uh, all start off with prayer, please? Um, whether that's either you pray to Allah, or whatever. I'm not trying to be disrespectful or nothing. Just, I'm just kind of nervous up here about the community. <laughs> Worry about my kids, cause I didn't grew up right here my whole life too. I'm from 124 Benzing Road. I'm a first generation American too. And I just feel like we're under resourced and we're getting there. I don't want to. I don't want to backtrack. Cause I know my family's been working so hard too. And I understand. But let me start off with prayer first, please. Um, dear Heavenly Father, please thank you. Uh, thank you for today, God. Thank you for allowing us and giving us the opportunity to all be under one roof and be unified, God. And God. Um, I pray that I pray that that the right thing happens with the community, God. And I thank you either way, God, for everything that you provide us in the community, God. And I just pray that it just keeps going well, God. And I pray that you give me the right words to say, God, so these people understand in front of me what I'm trying to say and the message I'm trying to get across, God. All right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Because I didn't have a four point on my whole life. It's okay. I, I really know what's best for the community. Okay. Yeah, I know right now it seems like a, a temporary investment that's good for the community, but probably it's not. It's going to backtrack. It's, the community's already overcrowded. We need more. We need more resources for higher education. They built the Fort I Center right there. We're the, the area we're literally in is lower Antioch. We're we're the heart of Antioch. We're the heart of Nashville. We we literally uphold the peace right there. It like and be also because like that that area like it used to be such a 
a country area, people aren't used to it being commercialized and actually uh, generating income. People never seen it like that. They just thought it was a place to live. But in reality, I feel like um, it's, be, it's, it's become a thriving economy in town, which helps Nashville thrive a lot now, and, and people don't really realize it in that lower part of Antioch. You know? I feel like I feel like um, if we do the the right things right now, because it's, it's a new age, it's a it's a digital age now. Like before, people were caught up in the recession, the Great Depression, all that. So people were worried about affordability. But these days, affordability shouldn't be a problem if we create the right economic resources to generate the income. Because Nashville, we're the we're like the like the number two, number three growing city right here. And so, thank you. We, our rules say that you have two minutes. We gave you lots of time. You did a great job. We understand where you're coming from. And uh, the councilman who's dealing with this project, uh, I know that he cares deeply Can about this community. So Just thank you for coming to speak. Thank you. I swear I have a billion dollar idea right there that, that will make us all happy. I swear in that same area. The councilman will, will talk to you, okay? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, you did a great job. We appreciate you coming down. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing that, two-minute rebuttal. Uh, 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 I appreciate it. I've talked to this gentleman. I mean, I think when we met with the community, the community actually wanted to see some commercial here. Um, and the original plan had a building that had a commercial component. I think he has some ideas along those lines, but the policy didn't support that. Um, it's not that we couldn't still consider that. It's just you would have a hard time recommending approval based upon not conforming with the policy. And I think that's probably what he's going to want to talk about. Um, back to the plan, however, uh, the plan, the layout, and I, meant, I just failed to mention this, I'll mention it now. The plan that you see it's not just a hodgepodge of houses placed on here. There's topography. There's a lot of things going on here. And these buildings are have all been placed in, like, the tucked under garages are placed in areas where you can work with the topography. So pretty much everything you see in white will be left undisturbed. So uh, there's a lot of vegetation on this property. Even those darker areas that are shaded, those darker areas actually indicate some steeper slopes. And you see we stayed off of those steeper slopes. So uh, this, this project can be de designed and developed so that the majority, the vast majority of the vegetation remains, which is something the community wanted as well and something I failed to mention before. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Um, we'll continue to work with the council member. We'll continue to work with the community. And um, I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman, you're recognized. First of all, uh, I'll, I'll work with you, Don. Leave, make sure that you have my phone number so we can follow, continue the conversation. Um, so this is an interesting site. Uh, it's very rough, uh, steep, hard to develop. Over the years, we had uh, community meetings with different developers, and I always challenged them to do a charrette. I thought that it was a big enough site to, um, to encourage developers to go with a clean slate to the community. And I attended the meetings uh, that uh, Mr. Dale had. And the first meeting, people came in and, and they were like, so what are you proposing? And I'm like, they're not proposing anything. They want to know what you want so they can actually come up with something. And it was weird for people because they were not used to being asked what is that they wanted. So I, I have to thank Mr. Dale because over many meetings he uh, work with them on uh, trying to figure out what is it they wanted and this is what they came up with. My main concern had to do with two things. Safety, like he said, it's a big concern over there. There are drive-by shootings, there are gangs that drive through Benzing and terrorize the local, there's a Laotian community that lives on Benzing and, and they terrorize them, so it, it is a problem. And the other big problem is water runoff. The water comes down the hill like the world is coming to an end. And over the years, people have asked me to do stuff, and the city just won't go and do the repairs they need to do to, to stop the water from flowing. So I understood that the only way was to find some kind of a developer that will develop and address the issues of uh, water runoff. And so uh, I, I'm hoping that we can continue working to find uh, a, a solution to this problem. They won't let you talk, the, your, the hearing is over. I'll talk to you later, I promise you. Uh, but at this point, uh, I would like you to 
endorse what they have done so I can move forward into the next phase and try to continue this process of inclusiveness. I do have to say I, I got a phone call from one person uh, that is against traffic and that's a concern on that road. It's very, uh, it's, a, it's a way people get to get around Bell Road and they go through Tascalam. Uh, and so it, it can be a problem, uh, the traffic on that road. But, uh, but uh, that was, that was a cons a, something I heard from one person. Uh, other people asked that uh, they, they use the development to leverage maybe installing a traffic light in the intersection to deal with traffic. So this is uh, an opportunity to address some of the concerns people have. So at this point, uh, uh, like I said, I didn't get any many pushback on this project. Uh, it isn't my project really, it's their project, but uh, so I'm, I'm comfortable in allowing it to move forward and, and, uh, and see as we go through the council if there is any more um, tweaks that can be done. Thank you, Councilman. And do you have a petition? Is that what that is? Yes, sir. Can I also say one more thing? Uh, sir, unfortunately, the public hearing is closed. Um, you know, but the councilman is committed to talk to you, okay? So make sure you get his number. Yes, sir, because I started a record label out here, and I know I could start nonprofit organizations and nonprofit organizations to actually... Yes, this record. would be a good time to talk to the councilman after the meeting, okay? Okay. All right, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Elam, you want to... Start. Um, I'll just say again. I applaud the process that that you all, the applicant, went through, um, and I'm inclined to support staff. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, no, no comment. All right, Vice Chair. I just want to say that. Um, well, I have one technical thing on on uh, the traffic and parking recommendations. There is a reference to currently the commercial land uses included in the site plan are expected to include general retail tenants. So if there are no commercial uses, does that condition need to be taken out? That could have been, um, initially when the plans came in, like the applicant said, there was some square footage set aside for commercial. Okay. And so um, we've con I confirm with, with the applicant that, that it was commercial space, a coffee bar intended for the residents only. It wasn't going, it wasn't intended to be um, commercial space outside of, of the, the users of the SP. So I think when that condition was written, maybe um, that wasn't, the traffic engineer wasn't aware of what okay. type of space it, would, it was intended to be used for. Okay, so do we need to delete the condition or does it matter? I think we can handle that, <clears throat> excuse me, with the final. There would be some additional requirements if it were to be something that was open to the general public in regards to loading or right. or parking and those sorts of things that wouldn't necessarily be triggered if it's um, a internal space that a lot of multifamily type developments have. And so we can handle that with the final. Okay. Let's, let's note that we need to make the correction. The okay. staff will make the correction. Up. Okay. Okay. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I like the mixture of housing types. Um, I do think this will be a good thing for, for the neighborhood. I like that they've addressed some of the uh, stormwater issues that sound like they need to be addressed. And I hope that um, we can find a way to, to work with this gentleman. And thank you, Councilman, for, for doing that. I support staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims. If all our councilmen were as <laughs> good at working in the community, our job, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> um, I'm really interested because um, in my former life I had a lot of research um, studies with students that looked at what other cultures may want as they assimilate into ours and common ground and common um, areas where they can actually, because they have families are big and um, do I, I guess because I don't have the, we don't have the technology running tonight, I don't know where that is, and I don't, I guess that's a question for Mr. Dale is, and that's just a hard well, research what finding the, about. What's, what's the question? Um, we're paying attention. <laughs> the, yeah, oh. w yeah, open question. spaces and, and, you know, large family spaces. Um, so there's a large area along Benzing Road here um, in this area. The depth from Benzing Road to the uh, townhome units back here 
It's about 250 feet or so from the actual road, and then it, it kind of narrows as you move to the north. Um, that area, a lot of that in ca contains existing vegetation that is indicated to be preserved in the area. And then also kind of between each grouping of, of units, there's, there's um, vegetation that is shown to be retained as well. And these dark areas that the applicant was referring to are the areas where the slopes are a little bit steeper in the 20 to 25% range. And um, you can see that the development footprint is located outside for the most part of these areas. And that was intentional. Um, and then there's also some open space down here at the southeast corner, kind of interspersed throughout the site. I wanted to also add, um, yeah. Commissioner Sims, that at the in the front building, that's yeah. um, kind of the the largest building up closest to Tusculum Road. There is a large area that's kind of been referred to as the coffee bar area, which would yeah. be like a large community gathering space okay. um, internal, and there's some open space external to that as well. And so there's a combination right. of different types of spaces that can be utilized by the residents within the development. And this is probably a wish list, but. Um, the cluster uh, subdivisions now are requiring playgrounds or some kind of community groups. As we are getting more and more crowded and we're losing our common spaces, I wish we would require that kind of thing in subdivisions this large. And I don't know if that's something that we could do or, but I just can't imagine this many families and there's nowhere to go or play, so thank you. You didn't really ask, but I'll offer an input. You could yeah. put a place a condition oh. um, that the applicant propose a um, active recreation space before that we would review before the final site plan. Yeah. And recreation space is what's the technical term, Lisa, in the subregs? It's active or passive. It's active or passive, and I think that given um, the amount of input that. Um, the applicant has given with the community that it may be that um, as they get closer to actual development that they see who the people that are moving in, what works, what yeah. me best meets the need because some folks would rather have passive space mm -hmm. or the interior amenity space or a playground. And so I think that there could be continuing to be a conversation that we can finalize at the That'd final. I know in our American planning book not long ago, they were talking about subdivisions really now moving to that direction. So I'd love to add that condition. Commissioner so. Go. Uh, I, then again, applaud the process. Looks like it's working. So I'll make the motion and try to include the condition. So I move to approve staff's recommendation and add the condition to add an active recreational space. Active or, active or passive recreational space. And remove the condition for um, the commercial parking. Right. Okay. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And it passes with those additional recommendations. All right, we are on to item 28. Uh, All right, so for item 28, let's make sure that we, uh, is there anyone in the room that is opposing on, on item 28? I wanna make, cause this was a, this was a consent agenda item. Anyone in the room opposing item 28? This is a um, concept plan, item 28 is a concept plan to create 72 lots. Um, on Old Hickory Boulevard, um, 12474 and 12478. We just want to make sure. If there's no one in opposition, uh, the chair could entertain a motion and put it back on consent. That's a proper motion. Oh, oh are you opposing, John? I just need to 
say something to you on the floor. I'm a problematic. It's problematic with this subdivision and every other subdivision you're addressing. So yes, I'm against it. Okay, go ahead. I'm 28. We we did have one item that we've received word can go back on if you want to do that one now. Next item on the agenda is item 28. The request is a subdivision concept plan approval to permit 72 single family residential lots. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. As a reminder, the subdivision process generally involves three steps. The current request is for concept plan approval, which is the first step generally in the subdivision process. The second step is final site plan. Third step is final plat. This application only deals with step one. This site is located on Old Hickory Boulevard, approximately 630 feet northeast of Murfreesboro Pike in the Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan area. It is located in the single family residential RS10 zoning district. Cluster lot subdivisions do not allow more density than the existing RS10 zoning district. The cluster lot option, which this subdivision, which this request is requesting, allows for smaller lot sizes in order to work with existing topography and to create open space. As a reminder, in order to achieve harmonious development, the Planning Commission has adopted subdivision regulations that include standards for specific transects. The conventional regulations found in Chapter 3 were used in evaluation of this application. The proposal is a concept plan to permit 72 single-family residential lots using the cluster lot option, proposed open space and right-of-way dedications. Proposed lots have a minimum area of 5,000 square feet and orient to a public street. The plan provides for three internal roads and three future roads, road connections to parcels to the east and west, including the extension of Peaceful Brook Drive, which is a collector street, part of the major collector street plans. The plan also provides for six acres of open space, which consists of, of approximately 30% of the total site area, as well as an amenity area and stormwater treatment areas. The proposed concept plan meets the requirements of the subdivision regulations as well as Metro Zoning Code. Given the aforementioned, staff recommends to approve the conditions. Thank you, sir. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up, state your name and address, and you have 10 minutes, and you can save two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, my name is Hunter Dale with Dale Associates, address uh, 309 Harwich Court, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, 37211. Go ahead and save two minutes for rebuttal. Um, uh, as Gene said, you know, this is a subdivision, a concept plan for subdivision. Uh, we've worked with staff over the past five months, I believe, to just make sure that we dot every I and cross every T. Um, we met with traffic and parking and expanded our traffic impact study to include future development and then offered up a left-hand turn lane um, into the site uh, that was not part of the initial traffic impact study. Um, you know, we're extending a collector street. We actually had a um, environmental analysis done to ensure we're protecting the existing streams on site. Um, so yeah, yeah, I haven't heard of any opposition at this point um, so far, but I'd be glad to address anything as we, as it comes up. So. Good deal. Save two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of the proposal? Seeing none, anyone in opposition? Oh, in favor? <laughs> Your Honor. You're okay? Yeah, no, he's, he's fine. Okay. <laughs> anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. We've, we've talked already. Our okay, welcome. Time. Uh, yes, I'm John Stern, and here really organizationally uh, with the Nashville Neighborhood Alliance, um, because we're going to speak about process. Uh, so whoever's doing the timekeeping, if they could adjust that. Well, and I do want to remind that um, our rules do state that you need to have um, for five minutes in writing ahead of time before the meeting, just for future reference. Okay, you, and I'd reference back to you that that's not very citizen friendly. But despite that, uh, once again, this district is not being represented well. Uh, certainly, with the subdivision process, it may not really matter. Uh, because as we learned at your work, work session with Sam Edwards a couple of weeks ago, you really have nothing you could do other than evaluate whether the subdivision applies to this quantitative standard or it doesn't. 
and it doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter what people say, but when it comes, push comes to shove, you all really cannot bring in the kind of qualitative measures that comes from hopefully informed community comments. And I'd like to push you all to try and create something uh, rather than just having people coming up here talking about subdivisions that they have no way of changing, provide them with some options, provide them with some ability to uh, make them fit better into their communities. Let them bring evidence to you of the particulars in their neighborhoods that can help inform the desirability of these developments that come before you. Um, maybe the subdivision regs also need to be taken a look at and see if we can't create either higher standards, maybe similar to what some of the SPs that you all have been looking at over the months and years, uh, and maybe even creating ranked standards uh, that would apply to a given, uh, to a given planning uh, transect uh, or whatever. Um, however, we need to give the community a reasonable level of meaningful engagement in the subdivision process. We're certainly willing to help work with you on that, um, but I don't, I think that it's a piece of the puzzle that's missing right now, and you all be, be continue to be frustrated by it and uh, members of the public will continue to be frustrated by it until we figure out a resolution to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal. Um, so I don't, uh, I'm the designer for the concept plan, so I don't know as much about the zoning, but I did talk to some people in our office. This was rezoned last year, um, and I think it was a two-year rezone process where it changed hands from one council person to the next. And from what I understand, there were multiple community meetings um, discussing the base rezone for this, and an SP was not brought before the planning commission. So this has already gone through the planning commission, gone through council as a base zone change. So at this point, it's just a standard subdivision based on that. I guess I get to speak now. <laughs> My yes, name is do. John Gill, and uh, I reside at 12474 Old Hickory Boulevard. This is, uh, I've lived there for seven years. And um, we've seen the things changing in the area, and my wife and I decided to, might be time for us to develop the project. When we decided to do that, I consciously made a choice not to try to make it a high density area where you've got a lot of uh, townhomes in there. I wanted to keep it more community friendly. We were approved for 80 lots. Uh, we finally settled on 72 lots, which I'm very happy with because when I look at it, like you said, we've got six acres of open space. It's more of a, a, a community rather than just a, excuse me, a subdivision. So I think this is something that's positive. Uh, during the council meetings, we did go with uh, Sam Coleman. He was the original. I got to speed it up. I can see that. We had two meetings with him. First meeting, we had a lot of folks show up. Second meeting, hardly nobody. Then it uh, switched over to Miss Lee. Two council meetings there. Nobody showed up for either one of them. The people in the neighborhood, they were satisfied by all the answers with the first meeting. So uh, as far as I know, we have the support of all the community, and I think we've got a good project going for there. Thank you, folks, very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair, you want to go first? I want to support staff's recommendation. All right. Why don't we? Is, is any? Is there any discussion on the project? Maybe we should try that, and then, and then if not, we can make a motion. Is there any? I want to make sure all the commissioners have time to speak. Any? So why don't we try to make a motion? I will make. Do you want to say something? Seeing no discussion. Oh, <laughs> um, I will make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. Chair, I Opposed? put. Oh. probably need to abstain because I was outside the meeting. Abstain. Okay. Councilman abstains. 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and Councilman is abstaining. All right. We, and Lisa, you said there was an item that got worked out as well, another item that was on the consent. Yes, okay. all of this time is allowing folks to talk to applicants and we're getting some stuff figured out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so item number 34, which is a final plat to create two lots on Stevens Lane. Um, if I understand it, there was um, some opposition, but the uh, owner has been able to discuss with the um, folks that had some issues and they've gotten all worked out. So I don't believe there's anyone in opposition any longer on number 34. All right, so let's check. Anyone in the audience opposed to item 34? Oh, okay. Well, we'll get to that item. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. Sorry. Perfect. All right, he's, so there's a person in the audience for it. Okay. All right, so the chair will uh, entertain a motion to put it, item 34 back on the consent agenda. I'll make a motion that we put item 34 back on the consent agenda. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing it, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Item 34 has been passed on the consent agenda. Thank you, sir, for coming in. Item 29. Yeah. Okay. Part two. There we go. Thank you. Item 29. The next item on this evening's agenda is item 29, Mosswood Lot 57 Subdivision Amendment. This is a request to amend the previously plotted setbacks. Um, as a quick note, these requests are typically reviewed through an administrative review, which requires the signatures of adjacent property owners. Um, in this instance, the owner did not supply the signatures of the adjacent owners, and therefore an application of this nature requires a public hearing by the Planning Commission. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. The site is currently zoned R8, which is, uh, requires a minimum 8,000 square foot lot and is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes. Setbacks are controlled by both the zoning code and if indicated on a plat by the requirements of the plat. Whichever is more restrictive applies as the standard. If removed from the plat, the setbacks will be determined by the zoning code as shown. In consultation with the codes department, it was determined that the required zoning setback along Laredo, which is this street that you can see just up here at the north of the property, um, would be approximately 40 feet, which is consistent with the currently platted setback. The Reese Avenue side would be treated as a side yard for the purposes of setbacks requiring only a 10 foot setback. The image illustrates the minimum required setbacks if the plat amendment were removed or if the plat amendment were approved. Um, please note, units could front on Reese Avenue as the codes department can designate either street frontage as the front. This does not change the setbacks. The platted setbacks for this area have created an established pattern for the existing structures along both Laredo and Reese Avenue. The adjacent structures to the south along Reese are constructed consistent with the platted setbacks of a 40 foot distance. The request to amend the platted setbacks would disrupt the established pattern along Reese Avenue. The amendment would allow for a placement of a structure at least 30 feet in front of the adjacent property immediately to the south where the cursor is shown now. The next slide shows what is currently required by the plat. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to disapprove as the requested amendment to the plat would not create a consistent pattern to the south along Reese Avenue. Thank you, sir. We'll open this item for public hearing. The applicant has 10 minutes and you can save two of the minutes of the 10 uh, for rebuttal. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 1806 Allison Place. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the owner for this one. Um, and as a point of clarification, uh, the staff indicated to you that we're asking to remove the platted setback along Reese. In fact, we're only asking to reduce the platted setback on Reese uh, by 50%. 50, 50%. So we're asking to reduce the platted setback from 40 feet down to 20 feet. Um, it's a 50% reduction. It's something that's consistent with what the current zoning code permits. Uh, if this didn't have platted setbacks, we would be able to reduce that down to 10 feet on the side. So what we're asking for is um, it's not a full reduction. It's just it's that 50% down to 20, 20 feet. Um, so uh, the, the other thing I wanted to point out is um, while there is a platted setback along Reese, none of those houses are at 40 feet. They're all a little bit closer than 40 feet. Our current house is at uh, 37 and a half feet from, from Reese by survey. The houses that go south are a little bit in front of that 40 foot setback. It's relatively inconsequential, but worth noting anyway. Um, so the main reason we're asking for this 20 foot reduction is so that we can create a building envelope that allows us to do something that's more compatible with the emerging development pattern um, of this neighborhood. Uh, right now, with the 40 foot side street setback, our building envelope is reduced to 43 feet in width. Um, what that would essentially force the, the owner to do is build two fairly tall and skinny uh, and attached residential units. Uh, the, the owner's asking for the 20 foot reduction so that we can widen it to 63 feet. Uh, he's committed that he would then separate the houses. It would also allow uh, for a slightly wider footprint for each house and he'd be also be able to reduce the height um, a, a little bit and, and get the needed square footage in two and a half stories. Again, that's something he's committed to the neighborhood. Um, the owner did try to reach out to the abutting neighbors. He went out at least twice, and as is often the case, nobody's home. Uh, he's fairly busy. Uh, he had somebody else go out, and nobody's home, and he felt like he's just chasing his tail trying to get all the, get these signatures. So he felt like he'd just roll the dice and, and try to work something out with staff, and ultimately uh, come to the commission and ask for uh, that reduction. He did meet with the neighborhood association. I met with the neighborhood association at least twice. We've, we've had a lot of communication with the community. Uh, and in every case, uh, members of the community have supported our request to reduce this down to 20 feet. The neighborhood association overwhelmingly supported our request on the condition that we do separate the houses, that we uh, do build uh, two homes that are two and a half stories in height. Uh, and we've committed to that. He's worked with this neighborhood a lot. Uh, and he knows that if he doesn't build that, he won't get any more favors. Uh, so again, that's something we've committed with them to, uh, to them. Uh, you heard from Council Member Roberts very early on in this meeting. Uh, she's supportive of the request as well. And uh, Council Member Roberts would definitely not come down here if she didn't feel like she had community support. Um, so we feel like our request is pretty consistent with uh, the practice that's enabled by the zoning code. We feel like it'll enable a, a development outcome that's a lot more consistent with the emerging character of the neighborhood. Uh, and with that, we respectfully request your support. Thank you, sir. We'll reserve two minutes for your rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, you don't need a rebuttal, do you? Yeah, one oh, one more point. Okay, <laughs> you can put in one more point. Well, I was just going to say we, we we did send out notices to uh, surrounding property owners, and we didn't hear from any of them. And I think the fact that nobody has showed up, nobody's communicated with the council member that they they don't support this. While it's not technically an endorsement, it's effectively an endorsement uh, that they at least don't oppose it. Thank you, sir. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, we declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Sims, you want to go first? <laughs> We're doing rotation. <laughs> um, I actually did go and walk around this whole neighborhood because this one was interesting to me. Um, my my uh, my my reaction to was uh, there were a lot of people outside. Um, 
and that the setbacks really would matter here. A lot of times I don't know if they do, and in this case, it, it, I think it really is a matter of the way the houses are are set and the emerging pattern that you're talking about is something that at least I have heard from the neighborhood that is not something they particularly like. So I'm going to go along with what the staff has said and disapprove it. Commissioner Gallo. Uh, I'm inclined to agree with Commissioner Sims. I think uh, you've got to have a real compelling reason uh, to, to make this change and be concerned that we're setting a precedent. And so I support staff's recommendation. Just for Commissioner Moore. I just have a quick question. I know he mentioned that um, if he was not able to get the setback reduction that they would have to, or they would be more <coughs> than likely build taller houses. Is there like a height requirement on this property? Just curious. Sure. So the property is zoned um, R, uh, R8, apologies. Um, if this, and it's generally three stories is what is permitted by zoning, um, depending on if this, this is within the UZO. And so within a UZO, you're permitted to be three stories and 45 feet, and, and then you can have an exposed basement um, that uh, can be another seven feet, so you can get upwards of uh, 50 feet um, by right. Um, under the zoning. I did want to just make a point of clarification too because I do think that it might not be entirely clear and I think we mis misstated something in our report but um, it would not, it would as Dwayne has indicated be a reduction from 40 to 20 as opposed to um, 10. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that, on the Reese side. No, that was my one. Councilman? Commissioner Elam? Commissioner Tibbs? Pretty much in agreement, but could, Patrick, could you show that one where the they're moving? That went a little too fast for me. <laughs> so that's what zoning would permit if the setbacks were removed. Um, however, if the request is to go to 20 foot setback, obviously it would double the distance uh, along Reese. Um, and of course, that's what's required by the plat as the lot currently sits. Vice Chair. Does this go to council after us? This is just us. Okay. Um, I think looking at this area that if you could start over, it would make sense to, to redo that whole end of whatever it is, Laramie and Reese, but um, that's not the way it is. So I think it needs to stay consistent. It's time for a motion. I'll make a motion that we support staff's recommendation of a disapproval. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? second? Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of staff's recommendation to disapprove, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. It's disapproved. So I have so many notes on my paper that <laughs> did I do, did we already do 34, Is it Lisa? It's did we? It's on the consent. Uh, there we go. We already vote on that. Okay. I want to make sure the chair is following his own notes. So we are on item 43. We got two more. 43. All right, so let's try this before, we always try this, but this one was on the consent agenda and was pulled off. I wanna. They're here. They're here, okay, perfect. All right, here we go. Next item on this evening's agenda is item 43. This is a request to rezone from R6 to RM9. The staff's recommendation is to approve. The site is. <laughs> the site is currently zoned R6, which requires a minimum of 6,000 square foot lot and is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes. This site contains 1.11 acres and is located along Wallace Road at the southeast corner of Towery Drive and Eisenhower Drive. 
The site is currently vacant and contains some vegetation. Um, the site does contain frontage on Wallace Road, a local street, and Harding Place, which is identified as an arterial street on the major and collector street plan. The policy for the site is T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving, which is intended to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods with more housing choices and improved connectivity. Um, the surrounding land use pattern consists of single, um, as well as some two-family dwellings. Um, the T3 neighborhood maintenance policy to the west contains a large area of primarily single-family dwellings, but is zoned R8. The T3 evolving neighborhood um, area to the north and slightly east of the site um, contains some small multifamily garden apartments and two parcels which contain single-family dwellings. Um, parcels to the north and to the west um, along Tower Drive and Eisenhower Drive are primarily zoned for residential. Um, the site is located at the southern edge of the T3 neighborhood evolving policy. Um, the policy supports a range of residential, residential development, including single, two-family, and multifamily residential, depending on location and context. The requested zone district contains bulk limitations, which will provide a transition from the industrial and office uses located across Interstate 24 and from the commercial uses located to the south along Harding. The growth and preservation concept map, which reflects the desires of the community in regards to how Nashville should grow, identifies this site as a transition and or infill area. Therefore, staff's recommendation is to approve as the request is consistent with the land use policy for the site. Thank you, sir. We'll open this item for public hearing. And the applicant will have 10 minutes and you can have two of the 10 for rebuttal. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the commission, uh, I'm Joey Hargis, law firm Baker Donaldson, 211 Commerce Street, and with me is uh, Mr. Ben DuBose. He is the uh, property owner uh, applicant for you. He has a few remarks as well. Uh, thanks for taking the time to hear us tonight. Uh, um, we had reached out to Councilman Elrod, actually Councilman Elrod reached out to us uh, late last week, and we reached back with a willingness to meet with the neighbors. Um, before tonight's meeting, obviously we'll meet with them prior to, to public hearing at the council. Uh, and we obviously sent out the notices that the little postcards out. With that, had my name and number. I had not received any phone calls, but we did meet uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Sita, and I thank them for staying uh, this entire time. A very nice couple, and uh, my clients have spoken with them. But uh, just to sort of reiterate what Patrick talked about, this, uh, this, this rezoning is a good transition between the, the legally non-conforming, uh, very large apartment complex to the north, which uh, uh, is zoned R6 as well. Uh, this request is more to build a, a development similar in nature to the properties to the west that are zoned R8, so it will not be a clustered type multi family type development, and I'll, I'll turn over now to Mr. DuBose, let him talk just a little bit uh, briefly about what, what he's proposing to do. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben DuBose. Um, do I state my address as well, or does it, it's, okay. Yes. <laughs> 1601 South Observatory Drive, uh, 37215. And so what we're proposing is actually not an increase in density at all from what we could get through the subdivision requirement. It just saves us the process of the subdivisions and then with the maintenance policy to the left and, and everything, just the um, variances and things like that, it, it keeps us from having to go through all that. It makes an ease of development. So what we're shooting for is 10 single family homes um, that is very, is consistent with uh, the development to the left and uh, to the west and um, so yeah, that's the only comments I have. So we're committed to working with the community and, and uh, reached out to Councilman Elrod a few times and just weren't able to get a date down before this meeting. But so thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And we'll give you two minutes, save your two minutes for the rebuttal. Anyone in the room wishing to speak in support? <coughs> Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Get out. You've, we've been here a while. We've, I've been, been sitting too long. <laughs> we appreciate your patience. That's fine. I'm Ralph Cedar with, uh, I live at 234 Eisenhower Drive. Lived there almost 50 years and seen a lot of changes. And this to me is just the, the zoning change would cause more people to come into the, our area. And the traffic in our area is tremendous. The other Monday afternoon, I sat on my front porch and for, for 
10 minutes, I counted cars. 45 cars went in front of my house. There are 12 children just within six or seven houses right there in that area. We don't need any more traffic. Years ago, they put 200, uh, excuse me, 140 Habitat for Humanity houses behind Paragon Mills School. That is just unbelievable. And I just don't think that we need any more density. And I would like to find out, I don't know who to talk to or whatever, but it, was, it says here that it's zoned right now is R6. We never got a, a notice or anything that it was being changed. Nothing at all. It just all of a sudden appeared when I got this, it says R6. Well, we didn't know it. But I just, the density in that area is just tremendous. And I just don't think we need any more. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Ma'am, would you like to speak or anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <clears throat> Seeing no one else wishing to speak in opposition, two minute rebuttal. Mr. Chairman, I have nothing to right. Thank you. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Councilman, you want to go first? We're on the second round of the first. <laughs> For how long has that property been uh, R6? Uh, since at least 1974. 1974? Okay. So it hasn't been changed recently? N no. No. Okay. And I, yeah, we've ju we just confirmed it. So it's been at least 1974. Thanks. Commissioner Elam? No comments. Commissioner Tibbs? Um, I appreciate the comments of um, the gentleman because, you know, we always deal with traffic that comes up with all of us. And um, I know that um, I don't know if there's a traffic study or anything that's part of it, but um, they um, it, it supports policy for this. And um, I'm definitely his concerns are concerns of many around the city right now. But um, yeah, based on just uh, the the criteria they put forward for it, I'd have to be in support of it. Vice Chair? No, I think the fact that uh, basically that it's the same number of units under either zoning um, makes it a, a case to support. <laughs> Commissioner Sims. I just want to thank you for staying so long, and it is hard to sit this long and uh, be able to speak to us, but um, I, I have to support what the staff is suggesting. Commissioner Gobble. I agree. Commissioner Moore. I move to uh, approve staff's recommendation. It's a proper motion. Is there a second? There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those no, ayes have it, and it's adopted. We are now on to item. All right, let's get the scale of order of the I'm, everyone's talking, including me, so we come. <laughs> All right. Item 53. Thank you. Uh, the request is to rezone from SP to RM15A. The site is located in East Nashville, just off of Dickerson Pike, with frontage on Marie and Lucille Streets. Staff's recommendation is to approve. Um, as I mentioned, um, it's off of Dickerson Pike, which as you can see is primarily zoned commercial or MULA. Um, it is um, primarily established with other commercial uses. The surrounding area is zoned RS5 and has been primarily developed with one and two story detached uh, structures. 
In 2015, an SP was approved for the site, and this SP permitted 18 detached multifamily units. Um, access to these units would be provided by a north-south alley on the west portion of the site, and they would be um, located um, in kind of a, uh, well, I'll show you. Um, <laughs> and uh, this SP is currently under construction. Um, so the policy for this area is um, urban neighborhood evolving. Um, it is also located in the Highland Heights Supplemental Policy Area. The intent of neighborhood evolving policy is to create and enhance neighborhoods to include greater housing uh, choice, improved connections, and more creative and environmentally sensitive, sensitive developments. Um, the SP was evaluated under this policy. Um, looking at the Highland Heights Supplemental Policy, uh, this policy established a building regulating plan uh, to specify the types and scale of development that are generally appropriate for subdistricts and a mean of guiding, means of guiding the intensity of development within each subdistrict. Uh, the development under construction is consistent with the building regulating plan, which provides for a range of multifamily residential development. The proposed rezoning is consistent with the policy to increase the diversity of housing through infill development and is consistent with the guidance outlined in the supplemental policy. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the item. Thank you for your second <laughs> presentation. I embarrassed her earlier. Not really embarrassed, but um, so thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing and the applicant has 10 minutes, two minutes for rebuttal. Chairman Atkins, members, uh, Joey Hargis again, 211 Commerce, uh, Baker Dawson. Uh, this, this rezoning request is to change from SP to RM15A, which was the underlying guiding bulk reg policy for the original SP. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen rezonings uh, come before this, and, and Councilman Bedney has seen them before the, the council to undo an SP to allow uh, for some short-term rental uses. This this SP was adopted prior to the adoption of the short-term rental use regulation. So the, the, the date of, on the council bill, and the council bill is 2015-1096, approved by council in May of 2015. And being familiar with the, the timelines involved in here, obviously this, this SP occurred before short-term rentals. Uh, but the, the request here, and we've, we've put it on our application, is not to mandate short-term rentals or not to require them, but to allow future owners the possibility of doing so. That's it, simply from a, from a, a property right sort of thing. And, and, your, and your, uh, your own policy talks about to provide more types of housing choices. And like it or not, short-term rentals are a different type of short-term housing uh, arrangement in, in this county. But um, this, this request is, again, not to mandate, but to provide future owners, uh, these units will be for sale uh, to, to individual owners, uh, but to, to allow them some opportunity, should they wish to pursue short-term rental regulations, uh, to be able to. Um, uh, from my understanding, in talking with the client, the client originally approached uh, your staff about amending the SP itself to allow some short-term rentals after the adoption of short-term regulation. I know as a policy, the staff in this, this body uh, doesn't wish to do so. I certainly would advocate strongly that you guys reconsider that, uh, thus rather than rezoning the entire property out to permit that use. Um, but again, this uh, this property is about 140 feet from Dickerson Pike. Uh, it is oriented that ho that is a hotel to the west. Uh, the parcels north and northwest are zoned commercial limited, uh, and this development has already begun to spur redevelopment in this neighborhood. So. Uh, we ask that you uh, support staff's recommendation uh, for this and uh, uh, recommend approval of the request. Uh, as I stated, Mr. Uh, John Roots with here, he is a, an architect and, and, and partial owner, is that correct, of the thing? So I'll turn it over to him anytime he'd like to address things to you. Uh, thank you, Joy. Uh, my name is John Root. Uh, my company is Root Architecture. I'm also the architect on this project. My ad office address is 753 Alloway Street. Um, I guess I wanted to be able to tell you a little bit about the architecture and about the design and about how this project has really become a nice catalyst for this entire neighborhood. I believe in it. We have been working in this neighborhood a long time. 
Um, in a time where my, my, a lot of my clients are bringing Airbnb specific projects to me, wanting four bedroom, five bedroom, big homes, as big as we can get, et cetera. Um, this development, because of where it's at, we, we focused in on a need that we felt like the community needed. Uh, six of these homes are two bedroom homes, so they're not a large homes. Uh, we felt like it hit a nice price point in the neighborhood. So, um, and, this, and this rezoning request that we're asking for is just to correct a wrong that the original SP, we would have asked for short-term rental availability, uh, just because we, we don't wanna take that property right away from future owners. They are all for sale units, uh, so you could have a multitude of different housing options in this development. Uh, we are very close to a very, uh, one of the major commercial corridors in Nashville. We feel like it's an appropriate place to do this. Uh, your staff agrees with our, our argument, um, and I'm, I'm here to ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and we'll save two minutes uh, for y'all for rebuttal. Anyone wishing to speak in support of the project? Seeing that. <laughs> Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Talk to me. Come on up. Um, I respectfully request additional time as chairperson of the Highland Heights Neighborhood Association. Thank you. We're in the home stretch. Um, my name is Gordon Stacy Harmon. I live at 1826 Joy Circle. Earlier this year, this applicant, and this information's already been covered, but I wanna cover it again, um, who earned the approval for this current SP back in 2015, attempted to amend this SP to allow short-term rental usage. That amendment was withdrawn after it was indicated by staff that the amendment was not an initial provision of the SP. So instead, the owners of this development have decided to rezone the parcel to RM15A. The only reasoning that has been presented is to change it to a multifamily zoning that allows short-term rentals. I have several concerns. One, we believe that neighborhood maintenance was in effect when this SP was approved in 2015. This was the mechanism for them to have this particular density to do an SP. Now that the policy has changed, the owners are wanting to change to, in an effort to leverage um, a usage which would allow faster sell of the units, which haven't hit the market yet, by the way. In fact, there's still active construction on the lot, as we saw earlier. Point two, considering the continued demand for housing, I have yet to understand why a project can be justified to provide additional housing only to then change provisions to allow sale to investors whose intended use is simply as de facto hotels. As of a few months ago, uh, Nashville has approximately 2,800 non-owner occupied STRs. These are non-owner occupied and or are in multifamily zoning districts. District 19 almost has half of those with roughly 1,200 short-term rental units, non-owner occupied. District 5 has 160. In a recent article that, uh, that crossed my desk, it appears that the hotelier Marriott is looking at entering the STR market to prevent them losing market share. So I have questions. Why change from SP to RM15 at this stage? Does RM15 apply to all of these detached single family home type units? As a city, I know short term rentals is a topic that, that continues to be highly contentious, but how can we address housing when we allow midstream changes like this before units have even hit the market? When you consider global corporations like Marriott are getting into the game, how can we expect any ease on this housing demand should global corporations like them start using their deep pockets to buy up our desperately needed housing stock? Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anyone wish, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal. Thank you, members. Uh, not, not a lot to add here. Um, obviously, the, Mr. Harmon, I hope I got his name correct. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, sorry if I did not. Um, he, he's correct. Obviously, this wasn't the original position of the SP, and I spoke to that. The, S, the STRPs did not exist uh, upon the formation of this, and, and it is true, and I, I mentioned that in my testimony, that, that our clients did approach staff on amending the SP, and, and, and we're told so. But, uh, and, and to his point, RM15 would apply to these, and, and even in his own testimony, the market for these types of units is clearly out there. Uh, this would provide, uh, even in his own statement, an opportunity in District 5 to allow such uses should they wish to. Again, not all owners will want to do this, but it at least provides them the opportunity to do so. And I apologize for my phone ringing, Mr. Chairman. I left already. Um, 
that that concludes my testimony. Wife's probably wondering where I'm at. So, thanks. Thank you, sir. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And. Brian, I apologize, my friend. This is great. I don't want this one. <laughs> you should go first, when, Commissioner Governor. Why don't you give me an easier one? Um, well, I, you know, I got similar questions. I, you know, I, when did the uh, STR restriction on SPs, how does that work? Did I say that right? Can you clarify when the citywide framework for STRs was approved? Yes, um, so the citywide framework was approved in 2016, I believe, and what the citywide framework did was it addressed the allowance of short-term rentals in um, base zoning districts. Um, so that would be R, RS, RM, MUL, CS, DTC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, SPs, um, because they are a um, context-sensitive solution to um, uh, rezonings, did not include uh, short-term rentals as permitted in any uh, SPs um, outright. So in other words, if you look in the land use table in the zoning code under SP, the whole land use table is blank. It doesn't show anything. It simply points you to the note at the bottom of the table to say uses are as per the adopted SP. So what we see happening is that a lot of times with SPs that were approved before short-term rentals was, was a defined use in our zoning code is that we have to look at how those specific SPs are written and we have to make individual determinations, staff does, on SPs. And so depending on how an SP was written or adopted, de um, determines whether or not short-term rentals either owner or not owner-occupied are permitted. For example, the way that this SP was written, the uses were um, specified as um, detached residential units. In that case, because residential is a broad use category within the zoning code, then owner occupied short term rentals, which is a subcategory of residential, would be permitted. Not owner occupied is a commercial under the commercial uses, so it would not be permitted. Should this have been written as uh, it permitted? eight or however many, eight multifamily residential units, then neither short-term nor not, or I mean, not, neither owner-occupied or not owner-occupied would be permitted. And so it gets really into the kind of minutia of how those SPs are approved um, as to whether or not they are permitted. Um, Did that in does that help? I hope I didn't confuse yeah. you. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, yeah, that, that, that. That answers the question. I mean, I, I hate to see a zoning change in the middle of something under construction. Uh, you know, and I don't know that it, if I would have had an issue with it had this all been part of it. But so I'm going to listen to what all the smart people on the commission say. And uh, Commissioner Moore. So I, yeah, I have the same concern. So with the RM 15A and the short-term rentals, I guess what are the guidelines there? So if you have a whole section, they have their 18 units. Does it allow a certain number per those 18 or could they all be short-term rentals? Sure, so based on the countywide conversation and the countywide framework that was adopted for um, short-term rentals, um, it was split up into owner-occupied and not owner-occupied. Um, and the provisions of where those were permitted um, varied based on certain zoning districts. And so owner-occupied are allowed in some of the R and RS districts were not owner-occupied or not. Now, what the countywide framework did was it established zoning districts as adopted by the council where it was um, determined that not owner-occupied would be a permitted use. Um, and that would be in multifamily zoning districts, including the RM districts, as well as mixed-use districts, MUs, MU, GMUL, and DTC. And so that's what the countywide framework did. There is, there is no longer any sort of um, um, uh, cap uh, by 
zip code or uh, census track. There used to be a cap by census track, but that was before short-term rentals was split into owner-occupied and not owner-occupied. If I could offer, I think, because this has been a struggle, STRs, and just there's two policy questions you might consider as you deliberate. Our goal is to evaluate each zoning application before us against the policy. And so there are some categories in our zoning code that spawn greater conversation. Short-term rentals are one of them. Sometimes alternate financial institutions, for example, will generate discussion. And so the, the staff, we don't pick out a single use that's allowed and try to weigh that separately. We look holistically at what all is permitted and whether or not this zone district is appropriate. I'm not suggesting you agree or disagree. I'm just suggesting that we we try at staff level when we're looking at these not to pull out a use that may be perceived as, as problematic. Now, in your discussion, you may determine for whatever reason based on context that you have a concern, but we would just need to articulate that. The second thing is that I've grappled with is that council set out the citywide framework based on months of debate and discussion. And so I've, as we've talked internally about how our staff should look and use that citywide framework, we try very hard to respect it because the council put it into effect after months of debate and deliberation. And I'm not suggesting it's perfect, but they did make a determination at council about multifamily. And so we are simply looking at where multifamily is appropriate based on the policy. And that's how staff approached it. I hope I know you didn't ask, but I hope no, that helps and I, and I with respect the policy, that, the policy yeah. relationship a bit. And I just wanted clarification for myself. And I mean, I do grapple with that personally. I know that's what's been passed, but especially mid midway through a project to change mm -hmm. it, and they stated specifically for this reason. I just wanted to yeah. clarify that because sure. that's where I struggle. Councilman. <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> this feels like deja vu. Uh, and I have to say, I have the highest respect for uh, Mr. Hargis. He used to uh, be the guy that kept me straight at the board of Zona Appeal, so I learned a lot from him. So that's why I'm, I'm sad that I have to speak against his uh, uh, request. Um, there are many reasons why uh, after uh, we struggle so hard at the, at the council about short-term rentals. Uh, there is the issue of, uh, obviously, the nuisance, right? Uh, when you have a, a, a house that is nobody's looking into, uh, uh, and when, you, when we have an understaffed, underpaid, um, a cause enforcement department, it's very hard to uh, keep people that are going into a house and uh, spending a week in there feeling very happy about a bachelor getting married or whatever. So that creates a nuisance for the neighbors. And, and the reason that is a problem is because as a city, we decided for some reason that we're going to separate business uses from residential uses. So we don't want to have business uses uh, unless the community come together and agree that that's a uh, permitted use. So that's one thing. The other thing and that my passion had to do with affordable housing. For every house, that it becomes a short-term rental, which is a great investment for the owner because they can make up to $200,000, $300,000 a year just by renting it. And that takes a house away from the market, which creates inflation in the cost of living, and it's one less house that somebody can buy. So I, I'm, I'm coming to my opposition uh, from a affordable housing equity place, right? We, we have a big problem, I mean, you hear every day, uh, people in Nashville are frustrated because they feel that we are um, becoming a city divided by class, where you have very wealthy people, very big developments, and then the people that are, sorry for the long speech, I'm a politician after all, but, uh, so that's the other issue um, uh, that I have about um, uh, short-term rentals. And then there is the issue that we really work on a compromise, and then the state came and chopped a big chunk out of it. So a compromise that we went into with different parties, trying to find an, a, a, something that was inclusive of the business community and the, and the advocacy community, was undermined after the fact by uh, state preemption. So now uh, we are just trying to hold on to that uh, um, 
situation we have, which is not what we set out to do. Uh, uh, and so I think from a personal perspective, I tend to just, uh, I mean, if you have a short-term rental, more power to you, uh, I'm happy for you. Uh, but if you're going to build new houses and you don't have an entitlement to do a short-term rental, then I'm just not going to vote for it. So long story short, I'm going to oppose this. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Elam. Uh, I'm kind of playing catch up. I've not had one of these cases, so I appreciate the, the background and the explanation is very helpful. Um, I, I guess I'll look at it as such that, that if this was proposed today and the staff looks at the policy and tends to agree, they have to look at it not only as, you know, a potential short-term rental, but one day all these short-term rentals are not going to be anymore because the market is going to be so flooded that potentially um, they revert back to owner-occupied. And so if that's potentially the case, we want to create something that is good for the neighborhood. So from a planning standpoint, it seems like that is the underlying issue is does the staff feel like long-term, whether it's short-term rental or not, that the, the, the planning, the design, the context works for the neighborhood? So I'd be inclined to vote in favor. Commissioner Tibbs. Sorry. Um, if I may ask the, the applicant a couple questions, just a couple quick ones. Absolutely. Uh, John, actually. Um, the uh, sizes, what are the sizes of those um, uh, houses? Uh, the, the six two bedrooms are approximately, you put me on the spot here, but oh, I feel like it's 1,600 square feet. They all have two car garages. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, 1,600 square feet are the two car, two bedroom units. Okay. Uh, and then there's six facing Lucille and six facing Marie. I believe those range in, in between anywhere from 1700 to about 2000 i think 1850 is kind of the sweet spot there okay could you go back to that site plan that was up there i'm sorry um yeah because i was looking at it they almost look like um you know like a small cottages it was it was that the antenna of it all are it, they indeed this is a shared courtyard in the middle of the that's our, also our stormwater solution for the site um the driveway is on the west side so the traffic is minimized going in further into the neighborhood it's all kind of captured right there at the north at the west corners of the of the site uh, and the garages are all internal to the site okay okay uh, yeah thanks yeah I kind of uh, yeah that's it yeah I, I, I kind of agree with Ro like if uh, you know when you start saying short term I was la 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 you know because if it was just as it was uh, you know it I wouldn't have any problem with it, you know, if you had said it. So I think I have to approach it that way just because of um, what it what it is. I mean, uh, you know, going back to being zone RM16, RM16, yeah. So um, I, I, feel, I, I'm, I feel like uh, I can support it, not, you know, just based off of what it is as far as just a planning is concerned. I, I will admit I'm not crazy about the, I, I'm not, a, from my opinion, I'm not crazy about the STRP uh, non-owner occupied, but if I take that out of it and just look at it straight on what it is and how it fits in these, you know, the little cottages that we are, you know, approving all over Nashville, it, it fits it. So I would be prone to uh, support staff recommendation. Vice Chair. Um. So I, I have a real issue with the idea of um, rezoning SPs. I think that, that I, we had another one right down the street where we had the same case come up. They were asking us to rezone an SP to a multifamily and we dip, disapproved that one. Um, so I feel like we have a precedent for saying we're not gonna let this be a way around um, the specific plans. Um, I share the, the councilman's concern around affordability. Um, I think there are plenty of people in the city who would love a two bedroom, 1600 square foot home priced at a somewhat affordable price. And I think when we look at our other goals of Nashville Next, um, those are, that's definitely consistent with those goals. Um, 
thinking about the issue of is it compatible, would it be compatible today if they came in? It is a neighborhood evolving area. Yes, the, this multifamily zoning may be appropriate. They mentioned it was neighborhood maintenance in 2015, possibly. So at the time that the plan was approved, it was an urban residential corridor. There was a draft policy at that time for neighborhood evolving, but it was a residential corridor at the time that the SP was approved. Which would have approved, uh, which would have allowed multifamily. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, well, that argument didn't work. Um, I, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't like this precedent and I have um, not going to support the staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims. Um, I certainly don't like it. Um, we do know from hard research, I mean hard empirical research by the volumes that STRs add to our affordability problem. But more importantly, I think, is that we have a neighborhood that invested many hours and staff that just killed themselves trying to come up with a great neighborhood plan. That plan had to be built on stability of, of believing what they saw. And in this case, they saw an SP here, and they could look at that, and now we're going to start changing SPs. And I definitely think this is just in the world of public policy. This sets a precedent that anybody with an SP that suddenly wants to come back into a neighborhood and make them STRs. And I'm in that district where we've got, we've ruined entire neighborhoods with short-term rentals. And we can't do much about it because of the state, but we certainly can not encourage it by changing SPs. So I'm, I'm voting no and heck no. <laughs> Any other discussion? We need a motion. I'll make a motion. Make a motion that we disapprove staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Based on policy. Based on policy. Um, okay, can I take my beginning? Because I have, a, I guess, a question. Mm -hmm. Why is it based on policy when it, I mean, why does it matter? We, they yes. have the exact same number of units either way. This is what's in place. So why does it matter from a policy perspective if it's, I mean, it's, it, and this is an allowable, an a, a SP is an allowable use in this area. So why, yes. So when staff made a recommendation that this multifamily district is permitted within the policy, yeah. you're disagreeing mm -hmm. and that's okay. We just need to articulate a rationale why. And so it could be, um, you know, something related to the context um, or the placement of the site, it, it is because we're giving advice um, to council on this one, there's just got to be a basis for the decision. I might look to the single family neighborhood yeah. to the east. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I make a motion that we disapprove staff's recommendation that multifamily would not be consistent with the existing residential pattern uh, up Lucille Street, mm -hmm. um, whereas the current development pattern proposed um, is consistent. I don't know. That's, Can I, that's a proper motion. It's not. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any other discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval say aye. 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 Why don't we raise our hands? One, two, three, four, five, six. All opposed? <laughs> six to two, and it's disapproved. All right, so we are on other business? No, oh, this is going out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's start again. Start again. <laughs> we could. <laughs> Commissioner Godwell hasn't had two chances. <laughs> two chances. <laughs> So let's quickly finish up. Historic, anything in historic? Uh, no, we just have a, a, a zoning overlay okay. that's a new one that's coming up that, uh, that we'll be hearing um, in the Marathon Village area that's kind of going to the public. So that's something that's happening right now. All right. Jeff's not here on parks. We don't have anything on our executive committee except look for our next study 
our study group, our work session, study group, slash. Uh, anything else on executive committee? No? No? Director, any update? At the end of council term, there is always a really large number of applications moving through the planning department and all the departments and I just want to thank the staff for how hard they are working and also thank Let's each give them a round. Oh. <laughs> and also thank each one of you for your service because I know this is a big time commitment. And Lisa, thank you for <laughs> covering for my for my child's piano recital. So I really appreciate it. It's great to have a deep bench at the planning <laughs> department. So. Absolutely. Anything on the council? Except it's coming to an end. <laughs> All right. Seeing no other business, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, yes. Motion to adjourn. Whew. Good job. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.